you are fine uh, welcome all panelists and participants in this international we webinar jointly organized uh, with florida polytechnic university and my university dr ram manohar lohia with university ayodhya uh, you know very historic place and this is the second day of this webinar and today we are going to have <coughs> uh, dr ajit kausik from florida polytechnic university dr rajesh kumar from iit indore dr manoj gupta from ampri dr vijay kumar singh from south korea and dr himanshu misra from sweden so first uh, lecture will be by dr ajit kausik uh, he is associate professor i think in florida polytechnic university he, he will deliver uh, his lecture on magneto electric nanoparticles for personalized health care management uh, he has done phd from npl uh, his citations he, is more than 6000 with h index of 43 i10 index of 103 and he has published as many as 209 papers in international journal of repute so we are fortunate enough to listen such a good uh, orator and academician from florida polytechnic university so now i request uh, dr ajit kausik to uh, start his lecture dr kausik thank you so much professor varma for a nice uh, introduction and uh, thank you dr shesha for managing this wonderful conference this is really uh, informative beside uh, this and this is uh, beside this it's a matter of different happiness that you discuss your work with your friends and people from your own country which are very much uh, well accomplished so i hope uh, after this talk we can discuss further Uh, to help each other to produce uh, next level cutting edge research so today i will be talking about uh, magnetoelectric nanoparticles for personalized health management i uh, picked this topic because uh, as dr verma just has mentioned that uh, uh, i am a phd from npl so before come to this point Uh, before joining to florida polytechnic university i was uh, working at florida international university and uh, some of the data i am presenting today uh, were produced over there so this is my ethical declaration that some of the part i am presenting belongs to uh, florida international university this institute is also very close to my heart because i grew up over there so uh, as dr varma mentioned before that i am phd from npl and my advisor over there was dr uh, bd malhotra and in the last phase of my phd i introduced with dr uh, anchal srivastava he he really influenced me a lot about his knowledge in material science and he was very helpful at some point and not only like uh, just helping me one day we visited bhu and he was really a fantastic host which is really uh, a great point to acknowledge today <laughs> thank you for that <laughs> once again so one thing i learned at npl uh, is uh, numbers if any product in the world is not up to the mark then it has no value so Uh, having this thing in mind whatever i did in my research so far i try to accomplish that number game which has value somewhere this way or that way that influence state of the art or that can do something productive considering future research and future development so having this thought in mind during my phd i explored nano structures for biosensing applications and my focus was over there to make organic inorganic nano composites for 
immunosensing applications. So why did I select this topic? There's a perfect rational behind this because I was, um, I was trying to explore a system that overcome the problem of a polymer at the same time that also overcomes the problem of metal oxide. So we can mix together. And it was very simple for me, the kind of category I picked to make immunosensor that was very uh, cost effective and uh, performance was really appreciated. So after having fundamental training from National Physical Laboratory, I joined electrical and engineering department of Florida International University. And I did my first postdoc, which was, I would say, next level of my PhD training because I was more into developing prototype during my PhD, but here I got an opportunity to develop a product that can detect uh, cortisol biomarker. Cortisol biomarker is very, very important biomarker because this is directly associated with the psychological stress. And this has turned out that stress indirectly associated with a lot of diseases. And if we cannot control the stress of a patient, so many good drugs cannot be suggested to the patients. So in the pain management, this emerged that we have to calculate the level of stress of a patient. The level of stress means we can quantify the stress if we can quantify cortisol. And based on the level of cortisol, doctor decides his next level uh, plan of action. So after this project, uh, I moved to uh, College of Medicine of Florida International University, and I joined over there Department of Immunology and Nanomedicine to explore my knowledge of uh, uh, as a, a nano guy to uh, to develop nanomedicine for the treatment of neuro HIV. Neuro HIV is a serious concern, and uh, using nanoparticles for the treatment of neuro HIV is the main focus of this presentation today. And after working six years with College of Medicine, uh, I'm fortunate enough to uh, accept it by Florida Polytechnic University. So at Florida Polytechnic University, my research focus is early stage rapid disease diagnostics. And we are also more, we are also trying to develop smart system which are miniaturized and can be useful to monitor a disease because some of the diseases which does not have treatment, such kind of diseases need continuous monitoring because of the, so that based on the pattern, a best therapy can be prescribed by a physician. And uh, nano-enabled therap therapeutics is also my focus because we have a lot of drug in the, we have a lot of drugs which are approved by FDA. These drugs are very effective, but sometimes the amount of drug we are inhaling, we are, we are taking inside the body is not required, but we need more amount because of the, the delivery aspects. Sometimes we don't get enough drug at the disease location, but to have enough drug, we consume extra drug. Because of that, we are having excess of drug in the body, and sometimes these drugs are toxic. So to balance that component, we use nano systems so that we have enough drug at targeted site with more efficacy without side effect. So this is also the focus of my research nowadays. And directions of research, I can summarize like that. For both the work, I'm exploring nanosystems for disease diagnostics. And the focus is to make sensitive sensors which can, which can be useful for the diagnostics of a disease at very early stage. And due to portability and uh, uh, good packaging, they can be used for point of care applications because if we consider the case of infectious diseases like Zika, Ebola, nowadays coronavirus, they are not like uh, good area based diseases. They can be any, to anybody anywhere in the world, any region, maybe in a village, remote areas. So we need system that can perform diagnostics wherever we need. And because of the use of fantastic electronics, and nowadays a new component is emerging, which is artificial intelligence and Internet of Things, means we can analyze data artificially very perfectly without using a lot of 
human-based analysis. Besides, a wireless-based approach is, well, is also very important nowadays. So if we integrate this point-of-care system with artificial intelligence and IoT, means we can do, we can perform diagnostics the way it should be. And at the same time, we can, we can produce enough bioinformatics based on this bioinformatics analysis, which is like the part of big data analytics, can be useful to do a lot of good things. And all these things can happen in a personalized manner. <clears throat> because if I have diabetes and my mother, for example, it's not necessary that our pattern of diabetic is similar can be different because it depends on a lot of genomic variations and two people are always have genomic variabilities. So in future, based on rapid diagnostics, artificial intelligence and IoT, all big data analytics should be personalized oriented and the two patient may be the part of same family, may be suffering from the same diseases, may have different treatment. So I am I am believing that <clears throat> this is the future of diagnostics. So this is one side. Second is uh, we are uh, we are in process <clears throat> to optimize different methodologies where we can send a drug to the brain and for the treatment of or for the management of HIV virus in the brain. And if we have an optimized technology and we are capable to send a drug to the brain, then not only the HIV, we can control a lot of CNS-related diseases like Alzheimer, Parkinson, brain tumor, stroke. It's it's it has a lot of lot of potentials. So why did I select magnetic nanomedicines and why did I select magnet magnetically guided delivery? It has a very perfect rational and hypothesis that I will cover in my talk. So whatever I said so far, these ideas related challenges and, and, and prospects are summarized in these four books. So if you need, I can don't buy because money goes to publisher. I can send you personal copy. So first thing I wanna, though my topic today is based on um, nanomedicine, but I just want to have one or two slides based on uh, my work in the area of sensors so that uh, just have a little bit more delivery to the audience. So first uh, part of the talk is biosensors, and we know that biosensor, any sensor, not only biosensor, is an analytical device that convert any response to a measurable signal. So that measurable signal can be controlled, analyzed by various transducers, and we can have a very nice um, uh, uh, device according to the patient requirement or clinic's requirement. So the art to make a biosensor is always have a lot of components. And as I said that based on signal, we can select an appropriate transducers that is the part of different electronics or different um, smart nano component units. Based on that, we can make sensor very small, but the adoptability of the sensor is depends on its performance. And its performance, for example, selectivity, wide detection range, or low detection limit, always a game of selection of a material which is always uh, on top of a substrate and that material should be selected very smartly. So a material cannot be universal. I never seen any material that which is good for a lot of making various kind of sensors. Various kind of sensors means categorization of sensor is always based on the selected bioactive compounds. If we are talking about antibodies, they are immunosensor. If you're talking about enzyme, they are enzymatic biosensor or catalytic biosensor. If we are selecting DNA as a, as a bioactive compound, then they are genosensor based, based on hybridization concept. So based on the selected bioactive compound, we have to select a perfect nanostructures that can be a nano thin film 
on top of a substrate. And the role of that substrate is to capture that bioactive compound in maximum amount, keeping its functionality in view. So if we bind a bioactive compound with material directly, which is always recommended, if we are using cross-linker, then definitely we are making sensor of multi-component based sensor, which is not recommended. So there's so many materials can be a uh, uh, little bit uh, tuned based on our targeted applications. So having this knowledge in mind, I, inter I, I am introducing here my first project that I did at uh, FIU Electrical Engineering. So based on a lot of hit and trials, we wanted to make a sensor that can detect cortisol at very low level. Why cortisol? As I mentioned before, this is the psychological stress biomarker. If we can quantify cortisol, we can quantify the stress, and which is a part of a lot of pain-related management, especially when we are talking about neurological, neuro-related diseases like HIV, uh, Parkinson, Alzheimer, brain cancer, or any that any disease that can cause depression. So this is one side. So in this project, we made a self-assembled monolayer based immunosensor to detect cortisol at very low level. The detection limit was 10 picomolar. Then we integrated this uh, sensing chip in a microfluidic system. This microfluidic system is very small, like the size of a quarter, like half inch by half inch. And it was connected by microfluidic system. So it was automated sampling to detect cortisol. And our student customized this LMP9100 um, board. We bought this from Texas Instrumentation. And this tiny board was able to record cyclic voltammetry. So overall, we have a sensing chip, very tiny <clears throat> microfluidic system, self-customized board that can detect cy uh, cyclic voltammetry, and then all together packaging. It was like two cell phones on top of each other. We were able to detect cortisol at one picomolar, but we say always 10 picomolar for safer side, up to one micromolar selectively without any problem. So this device is the part of my first postdoc project and my advisor, Dr. Bansali, a great guy and still like a mentor to me. Now uh, he is thinking how to go forward and think about commercialization aspects. So having this uh, training in view, the time I was, we were at the completion of this project, the, another problem appeared in Florida, which was Zika virus. So Zika virus appears in around 2016 and that or 2015. This was very serious because this virus is spreaded by mosquitoes, mosquito bites, and this virus goes inside and create fevers and malaria related symptoms. But why this was serious? This was serious because this virus mainly affects the pregnant woman and the unborn child who are growing in belly of mama, seriously affected by this virus in a way that their brain did not grow well. So the size of the brain or size of the babies born with Zika virus was small. They are underdeveloped. This disease is called microcephaly. So this microcephaly was challenge. And that time there was no treatment of Zika virus. But if we use available anti-malarial drug in a right combination, we say cocktail of the drugs, that was manageable. But the detection of Zika virus has to be very often to understand the progression of disease. So that time we were contacted by Florida Department of Health and they wanted us to make a diagnostic system. So as I said before, if you have a very optimized recipe, then you can uh, convert this for other applications too. So I kept this, this concept same. What I did, I changed here antibodies. And this same concept worked very perfectly for the detection of Zika virus protein at 10 picomolar level. We did nothing much and that worked. But here we were more smart because we were trying to be more smart to have 
wireless based diagnostics and data sharing. So still we are working on this. And uh, at the same time, as I mentioned that uh, our laboratory was focused on Zika virus, oh sorry, HIV virus. This virus is very, very insane. This virus goes to the brain, affect the genome of the cell, integrated with this and create two kinds of set, active virus and latent virus. Active virus, sometimes it's manageable, but latent virus is not. Latent virus can activate any time based on so many regions, which is beyond our control. But because of 42 drugs approved by FDA makes life of HIV infected patients more longer because these drugs are very effective. But to optimize a therapy still, clinics are using ELISA or PCR based methods. So this comes in my mind, if we detect, if, if we make a system using interdigitated electrode and simple electrochemistry, can we control the electrophysiology of the cell? Because every virus and every treatment during infection treatment process that affect the electrophysiology of the cell. The same thing happened here. What did I do? I took this commercially available uh, 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 chip. This chip has a polymer on top of the patterning of gold and this polymer is very good to grow the cells. I grow CNS cells on top of it and infect these cells with HIV. I was correct. The electrophysiology of the cell changes on infection and treatment. And I optimize this monitoring of electrophysiology variation and observe that the magnitude of the electrical signal of the cell has connections with the health of the cell. And not only infection uh, with HIV or with the treatment, I treat HIV infected cell with cocaine. Why cocaine? Because most of the HIV patients has the problem of drug abuse. They don't have much problem with virus. They have much problem with associated side effects because they are used to consume uh, drug abuse, for example, cocaine, meth, heroin, and they use alcohol a lot. So even in these conditions, electro electrophysiology of the cell varies a lot. So it's like check and balance. If we optimized the viral load of HIV virus with reference to the electrophysiology, then we can have a very cost-effective clinical method for the progression of HIV, which can be used to optimize a drug so the work of many days can be done in a day. And all these ideas which I am presenting here got US patent already. So now we are dealing with a new problem, which is uh, coronavirus problem. So this virus is also very intelligent. And actually coronavirus, whatever dealing we are right now, is not new. So coronavirus appears in 2002, again 2013, now 2019. So, but there's a difference between these three kinds of viruses because this virus, which is called novel coronavirus, which is similar to SARS that came in 2002, around 70%, and another coronavirus that came in 2013, same 60 to 75 percent structure of this virus is similar to that came previously but the difference is that this structure is different a little bit because it has more spike proteins and more other proteins these other proteins and this s1 protein make this virus unique because now this virus has more functional site that can associated with the receptors that we have in our nose, which is ACE2, and can replicate in a faster speed. So at one point, this replicate in an expon exponentially so much that our respiratory system collapse. So if this go inside human body through the, through the nose, nose has ACE2 receptors, and they bind over there, integrate with the cells, 
and whatever we have in the nose goes to our lung and in the lung lung also has ace2 cells or tmp rss2 uh, again a protein so these receptors accommodate coronavirus in a lot of numbers and these lot of numbers replicate exponentially at one point at one point our respiratory system collapse and because why it collapsed because to survive inside the body ace2 based entry in the cell help in the replication of the virus but when this virus replicate it has to survive and to survive in the human body it consume the blood oxygen of human system that's why we have this problem so in the in the beginning i don't want to go in this debate that who did what but uh, every country including united states underestimate this virus and that's why we are paying heavy price for that so um, there is no drug in the market as of now and i don't know the politics of uh, pharma companies what's happening but according to my best knowledge there is nothing and precaution, precaution is the cure better we protect ourselves and we protect others so using mask is the best recommendations nowadays and this paper came i think 2 weeks ago in science that confirm using a mask is a good idea and no ex no need of expensive mask according to my knowledge even a sim simple mask made at home using cotton cloth would work so try to see that the cotton cloth sometime has bigger pores so you can have two layers so that you have less chances of inhale air present around you so what's our role here as we have developed a chip for the detection of zika virus protein we wanted to use same strategy to make a make an electrochemical immunosensor for the detection of coronavirus protein with reference to s1 antibodies and as i mentioned before our objective not only to make a chip that can detect uh, coronavirus protein we wanted to introduce artificial intelligence and at the same time internet of things so this kind of interfacing will allows to perform diagnostics at point of care at the same time we will generate enough bioinformatics which is required by pharma company to optimize or to make a better therapeutic agent that can be a vaccine antibodies or uh, protein peptide whatever <clears throat> and wearable sensing is always advantageous for so many regions so this is one part of my talk which is on biosensors and now i would like to jump to the main topic of my talk is nanomedicine so as i mentioned before our lab uh, at FIO in uh, medical college is focused on optimization of a therapy which can treat HIV in the brain. So uh, briefly again, HIV virus is again a very, I think every virus is very smart. So this HIV virus is very smart. This can infect, this infects our system, get into in bloodstream and goes to the brain. It crosses the blood-brain barrier. Blood-brain barrier is a barrier created by the four types of brain cells, and it makes a very compact layer under, under the brain. And this barrier is very important for every kind of biological functions in our human system. So this barrier only allow pass through the good agent, not the bad agents but sometimes things happen so this virus crosses the blood brain barrier integrate with the cns cells mainly astrocyte or microglia uh, neurons uh, i doubt but people claim that it affects neurons too but anyway cns uh, astrocyte and microglia is the major portion of cns system so it's uh, something to worry about so at the same time, when it goes to the brain, integrate with the brain cells, it infect cells and virus replicates over there. So now there are two cases. One is active virus, virus is replicating. Another class is latent virus. 
So this virus is smartly integrated with the genome of brain cells and do not replicate virus. So this is in the brain, but it's not producing the virus. So if it's there, and this can activate any time in future based on a lot of stimulations or body variations, again, this virus come to the periphery and infect our system. So anyway, neuro HIV cases in the world are around 10%, roughly, maybe less, but this number is a lot. And all the FDA approved drug are very good. They can eradicate HIV virus effectively. Even not only the FDA approved anti-HIV drug, there's so many latent virus activating agent which are also approved by FDA. So because of these combinations, the HIV patients nowadays has a quality life compared to past. And these advancements are really very impressive and there's a lot of progress, a lot of things are going on over there. So it's, it's very impressive. But now come to our point. So these FDA approved drug, anti-HIV or latent virus activating agent, do not cross the blood brain barrier. So we are treating virus below the brain, not in the brain. So what can we do? If the drug is not going to the brain, we have to send a drug to the brain. And to do so, we have to use self-generated methodologies, which are safe and more effective. So more efficacy, less side effect. So here, our focus is mainly on sending an anti-HIV drug to the brain that can activate the latent virus and again that can eradicate the active virus so this is shock and kill uh, applications so one drug has to activate virus another drug has to eradicate the virus so we need two drug component first thing <clears throat> second is this easy to send anything to the brain yes it is is this dangerous to send anything to the brain yes it's very dangerous so we have to make a balance with reference to the demand and its adoptability in human system. So medical science plays a very important role here. So some drug, they can be encapsulated in a polymer. And on top of that, we can put some receptors. Receptors are biological compound for mainly our peptides in that case. These peptides bind with the cell receptor at blood brain barrier and they capture this and one, uh, then after some time, they cross that barrier. But this blood brain barrier has pores, which are in nano size, around 20 to 100 nanometer. So one approach, which is functionalization of therapeutic cargo using a particular receptor, increases the size of the cargo and the delivery of drug to the brain is limited. These things works, but the amount of drug we need in the brain is less. So we have to do this often. So if we, if we are injecting something in human system and only 10% is going to the brain, 90% will live in the periphery. Unnecessary. Again, a problem, not in the brain, but uh, maybe in kidney, lungs, anywhere. And what other options? Let's stimulate this blood brain barrier, open it for a while, and things can go to the brain. This works too. Ultrasound-based approach and, and uh, electromagnetic field-based approach have been optimized to open up the blood brain barrier and amount of drug reached to the brain increased, no doubt. But here's a serious problem. So the opening of blood brain barrier pours and then after it has to block again. It's a time-based uh, process. It's a transient method. So during opening and closing, some unwanted particle also goes to the brain, and these particles or these agents known to affect the secretion of neurotransmitters, or they produces neuroinflammatory agents, which is not good. So we need a drug to, in the brain. If we are functionalizing um, cargo with the peptide, then amount of the drug is less. If you are opening blood brain barrier, amount is okay, but it has side effect. What left? What if we don't functionalize the cargo? What if we don't uh, open the blood brain barrier? What if we pull 
some medicine to the brain without functionalization or without opening the blood brain barrier. How this looks like. We stick with this idea. And we, in India, we all know that um, magnet always attracts iron. So we use the same very simple approach. <clears throat> Why don't we put a magnet on top of the brain and we inject nanomedicine, which has magnetic features. So they uh, travels through the bloodstream, accommodate under the blood brain barrier, and based on magnet or influence, uh, this attractive influence, the drug, which is like 20 to 100 nanometer size range, cross the blood brain barrier through the pores without affecting BBB integrity. So this was my rational and hypothesis, and we worked in this direction systematically. The, another concern beside this is the release of the drug. So Dr. we have Kisaki. to release the drug in a particular sequence. If we are not following the sequence, then it's useless. The first virus activating drug should come into the system, and then after some time, virus eradicating agents. So sequence of the drug is very important. And at the same time, right now we are talking about two drugs. So we use the same concept. Dr. Koshi? Yes, sir. Uh, can you wrap up in three minutes? Sure. So we use the same concept in uh, uh, using simple iron oxide nanoparticles, and we make a, a cargo which eradicate first virus activating agent and then virus eradicating agents. Results were fantastic but we do not have control on the amount of drug release because if we can control the amount of drug release, then it's more useful because sometimes drug is releasing here in, in a good manner, the way we need, but we cannot control the amount of the drug because excessive drug also causes neurological problem. So let's go forward. We, as I said, we replaced iron oxide with magnetoelectric nanoparticles. Why magnetoelectric nanoparticles? Because these are core shell nanoparticles. And here we have core of core, uh, cobalt ferrite and shell of barium titanium oxide piezoelectric materials. So this core cell system is very much sensitive to AC magnetic field stimulations. Once we apply AC magnetic field stimulations, there is a change of polarization at the surface. And due to this change of polarization in the surface, the drug bind with the nanoparticles uh, uh, released after some time because we have uh, electrostatic interactions between drug and nanoparticles. And we applied AC magnetic stimulation using pulse to pulse uh, feature. Because of that, one side of the bond expand, one side of the bond compressed. So this expansion and compression happen repeatedly within second, and at some point, this bond break down. So we are having this concept in mind, and we were successful. So what did we do? We synthesized magnetoelectric nanoparticles, perfect as we need, and then we check the toxicity because we have to optimize the amount, how much amount of nanoparticle is safe. So 50 microgram of MENP is better for these applications. So uh, before I was talking about two drugs, shock and kill, recently we got collaborated with Dr. Khalili in Temple University, and he investigated a gene that eradicate the virus, that recognize the virus and eradicate it at the same time. So rather than two drugs, we found one component, which is a DNA, very good, US patented, paper in nature, and he gave this to us. We bind this uh, Cas9 with our nanoparticles, applied AC magnetic fit stimulation, and this releases from the surface, and this is binding profile and release profile. So we came to know that at 60 Ostard for 30 minutes, we can release this Cas9 perfectly. This is more characterization showing the binding and release. And this is the experimental setup that was used to release the drug from nanoparticles. And this is functional efficacy. Even we, in fact, we observed that the drug released from the nanoparticles is more effective than the pure drug. Why this is happening? And because, because the nanoparticles, which is under stimulation at the surface of the cell, create poration. And this poration we 
uh, believed on the basis that this piece of this magnetoelectric nanoparticle on AC magnetic field stimulation not only produces the electric field, they are known to produce acoustics too. And if this acoustic mechanism is happening at the membrane of the cell, then phospholipid layer of the cell membrane breaks. Simple inspiration. And we stick with this concept and prove the presence of cell inside the nanoparticles using FIB assisted TEM approach. And not only showing this by TEM, we simulated this. So whatever we said so far, it's simulated also. So this nanoparticle, piezoelectric, this magnetoelectric nanoparticle is stimuli responsive with reference to AC magnetic field. It produces electric field at the surface, changes polarization, and produces acoustics too. It binds with M Cas9 released in controlled manner. If we are controlling the release, then it's a personalized approach. But the challenge is begin with that. Can we inject this to the mice? Can this go can this go to the brain in living being? Yes, sir. We optimize that. <clears throat> Sorry. We injected this nanoparticle in the tail of mice and we put this mice under this uh, simple magnetic environment and this magnet pulls nanoparticles to the brain. And we can see the distribution of nanoparticles in the old cell types without significant agglomeration. So data of TEM validated by STEM, and we also concluded that the particle inside the tissue has the same crystalline features, one which were in original nanoparticles. And at the same time, the safety aspects of nanoparticles are very important. So we did histology and neurobehavior assessment. We did not find any side effect of these nanoparticles. So this is something relating to the small animals, but we are talking about human compatible technology. So we have to optimize this in big animals. So we go further and injected this in a baboon. It's a 13 kilo baboon. Uh, no, yes, and it's uh, aged. And we observed that using MRI as a source of magnet, this pull nanoparticles to the brain and pre and post image analysis confirmed that nanoparticles are distributed in the brain, which is uh, really good news for us. But this is very important for us to check that baboon is human type. Um, can, you, uh, can you come to conclusion, please? It's conclusion. Yeah, thank you. So, <clears throat> so we have to check the biopsy. We checked biopsy. We did blood toxicity profiling. We did, we explore material tissue based interface using Raman spectroscopy and Raman microscopy and concluded that this is safe. And in future, we are willing to optimize this method for the treatment of uh, coronavirus infected patient because this virus is going to stay in body for a long time. If we have a vaccine or drug, what about the delivery of these drugs to the target? Because coronavirus is not, not only affecting the lung, it's affecting kidney, heart, liver, and brain. So in future, we are working in this direction too. Make a therapeutic cargo, organ specific, and try to figure out how we can eradicate coronavirus using nanomedicine approach. And thank you a lot of people here to acknowledge and grateful to my previous lab, present lab, collaborators, and, and Florida Poli, Dr. Hickman, Dr. Shesha, Scott, Antonio, our team here. Thank you very much. Sorry for taking me long. I lost time track. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Kausik, for nice presentation. Today's second speaker is Dr. Rajesh Kumar from IIT Indore. He did his MSc PhD from IIT Delhi. Uh, he worked as postdoctoral fellow, National Institute of Nanotechnology University of Alberta, Canada. And his research interest uh, is 
एक्सपेरिमेंटल सॉलिड स्टेट फिजिक्स ऑर्गेनिक एंड इनऑर्गेनिक सेमीकंडक्टर्स, नैनो स्ट्रक्चर्स रमन एंड पीएलएस एल स्पेक्ट्रोस्कोपी लेजर्स डिवाइसेस फिजिक्स इज साइटेशन आर मोर देन वन थाउजेंड विथ एच इंडेक्स ऑफ एटीन आई टेन इंडेक्स ऑफ फोर्टी थ्री and he has published as many as 129 papers in international journal of uh, repute so <clears throat> now i request dr rajesh kumar to start his lecture i'm um, sorry okay Uh, thank you, Professor uh, uh, Varma and uh, Professor Saisa, and the whole organization, organizing team, for giving this opportunity to talk about uh, my work and uh, interact with uh, other panelists here. So, when it was about, uh, when I was about to decide about this topic. Uh, whether I should talk about uh, the work that I am doing, so I chose this Raman effect thing uh, because of two reasons. One, it is because it is very close to my heart, and second is uh, when I saw the panelists, I thought it will give me a very good opportunity to interact with uh, many veterans from BHU and other universities. And it will also give me an opportunity to learn uh, learn Raman effect. and uh, i st i start with uh, with one uh, punch line from steel authority of india limited sale the punch line from sale is that sale is taking it to the site this that i translate that to raman effect is at the same in the in the field of science and technology and research and material science it is not an exaggeration to say that there is a little bit of raman spectroscopy in every material scientist and biological scientist and even engineers uh, in the field so this is very relevant and uh, very and after the discovery of lasers and uh, invention of lasers now at it has been, uh, now it's a very uh, important aspect in everybody's uh, life especially the the scientists from material science and this my lab uh, uh, i'll come to this my lab is materials and devices lab in short we call it mat lab and this is a little bit uh, advertisement about it indore is a young uni a young institution only 10 years old and some rankings and this photograph is from uh, from sky from aeroplane of the of the campus of our half built campus which is now fully complete and yes we at indore are pr proud of being from the cleanest city of india which actually is and this this photograph is from the iit indore uh, campus clicked on a simple mobile phone so campus is also also very beautiful and now i'll talk uh, this this is the outline of my my presentation i'll certainly would like to skip some of the very basic introductory slides which deals with the what what exactly is the raman effect and then how from the solid uh, the raman effect and how raman spectroscopy helps understanding so many things from a, from a material especially nanomaterials by means of uh, quantum confinement effect and fano effect or uh, electron phenomenon interaction Fano scattering and this beyond. Beyond uh, covers this uh, Raman microscopy, which I would take equal time in explaining that using Raman microscopy, what are the things that we are uh, why we are exploring. This is mainly my group uh, of uh, consisting of PH, mainly PhDs and MScs. There are three new PhDs uh, who have uh, joined. I have just started uh, working, and mainly I will discuss results from Devesh, Anjali, and uh, Manushri. And this is one of my favorite slides where I take opportunity to thank all my uh, students who helped me doing whatever I wish to do using materials and uh, and and, and uh, Raman. 
yes we were in news also for developing this uh, electrochromic device which sort of filters the heat component from the normal visible component now let's see what the raman effect is uh, i would uh, uh, request uh, the seniors to just bear for some time to because I, it will be a bit uh, trivial for, uh, for 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 most of you at raman effect we are proud to say the, this uh, about we talk about this effect which is an inelastic scattering of uh, photons and a very weak effect which a cv raman could uh, discover and i was awarded uh, nobel prize and uh, this published in an indian journal of physics followed by nature and yes we we celebrate it using google doodle and stamps and all this so let us see so this will be a couple of slides just to get give an overview of what exactly is the raman effect the raman effect is a scattering that uh, when a light falls on a molecule and then it scatters in the scattered radiation the the if you, if you analyze the scattered radiation then what we see is the scattered radiation mainly consists of uh, the same frequency which the molecule or the material was excited with in addition to that it is very small component as i mentioned in the last slide 1 in 10 to the power 7 uh, photons get uh, scattered in a way that its frequency is uh, is, uh, is is less than and more as, as well as more than the incident frequency and these are uh, subdivided into stokes and anti stokes component of the raman scattering and the intensities of rayleigh stokes and anti stokes are proportional to the font size uh, written here that means the rayleigh is the main component and then out of the raman component stokes is the major component is there so the two main observations from raman came was that stokes and anti stokes uh, were equally distant from the the incident frequency means they had the shift of the frequency were equal but the stokes and anti stokes uh, intensities were not equal so these were the two main observations and then these are the, the uh, semi-classical approach of uh, explanation of uh, Raman scattering, which is based on the on the this uh, uh, the the formula that uh, uh, the, this also gives the selection rule of, of Raman that uh, there should be a change in polarizability during the course of vibration. Those modes only will be Raman active. So, though this classical treatment is helpful in explaining why the stokes and anti stokes scattering come into picture but they could not explain why the intensities of stokes and anti stokes should be different to cover that this quantum theory uh, was brought and this somehow now explains that uh, why raman scattering take place and why the stokes and anti stokes are different intensities and uh, that that is directly related to the probabilities of these uh, of these uh, these uh, these processes so since this uh, stokes and anti stokes take place because the 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 photon either takes energy from the molecule or material or it gives back gives the energy to the molecule there are a lot of things to discuss about but the main thing that scientists use is that this phenomena leads to the fact that uh, this can be used as a signature of the molecule so a different molecule uh, will give a different raman shift when it scatters as a result that now people can identify that as the as a for for, for uh, getting the signature of a molecule that what are the materials present in the sample this is a typical example of uh, alcohol and the raman uh, raman spectrum from from uh, alcohol and there is a small story associated with this that during the nobel prize uh, distribution ceremony when cv raman was offered alcohol he did not take alcohol he never took alcohol 
So he said, you can see Raman effect on alcohol, but not alcohol effect on Raman. So with the, with that, that's the story it, it comes. Also, so because of uh, the nature of this poor uh, uh, interaction and the scattering, this also can be used to, to measure temperature or estimate temperature of the material. Not a very good technique or a very routine technique to estimate temperature, but yes, under difficult circumstances where temperatures are very high and normal thermometers don't work, yes, this gives a measure of temperature. This is the, the photograph of Raman spectrometer, which uh, Sir C. V. Raman used to, to discover uh, Raman effect. And this is the and this is the modern Raman spectrometer that we have here. And we thank Depart uh, DST to, uh, to for funding uh, you through FIST scheme. And also, I propose that. Uh, that if you wish to use uh, the spectrometer, then it would be great. I will love to. I will be pleased to collaborate and work together to, 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 to do good research. And now, uh, here I will say that from this discussion and also when people scientists use Raman as a routine technique, mainly they uh, talk about the identification of peaks that okay these are the different peaks available and then they identify okay these are the materials and uh, uh, the the component composition of the uh, materials available yes that can be done that is usually done but uh, what we do here in, in in my group is we try to explore whether uh, raman spectroscopy is only that limited to that or does the raman spectrum or one of these peaks is it possible to explore more uh, science, more physics, and uh, to touch upon different uh, scientific uh, uh, problems using Raman spectroscopy? So yes, the answer is yes. Raman spectroscopy is beyond, we just discussed that beyond only peaks. No, Raman spectroscopy is not only peaks. Each peak, the width of the peak, in, and each, the whole Raman line shape tells us a story. The only thing is that we need the eyes to explore that and understand what exactly is this uh, spectrum telling about the whole system. And I will talk about this uh, mapping also. So, and uh, to understand that, let us take this example of uh, Raman, uh, Raman, Raman spectroscopy from a solid. So here what you see is in figure A and B is that figure B is a typical Raman spectrum from crystalline silicon, which shows a peak of at 520 uh, wave number. And the line shape function is given by the equation that's written at the right hand side. If we see this kind of uh, Raman spectrum from silicon, then we know that, okay, we are dealing with a crystalline silicon. But any change in this uh, kind of Raman uh, spectroscope, Raman spectrum, if we see any change in spectrum, we know that okay, there is something has changed inside the semiconductor. The easiest thing that nowadays that people noticed was uh, when we make silicon nanowire or nanostructures of uh, nano quantum dot or anything, then this Raman spectrum clearly changes. Why does that change? Is because the whole phonon frequency spectrum changes or the phonon dispersion curve itself changes. Because when we have uh, the crystalline material, then we know what exactly the Raman selection rules are. It says it says that at k equal to zero, or the zone center phonon will only participate. But if it goes to the nanomaterial, then that's not the case. And various other uh, phonons also from the same phonon dispersion curve also participate. And as a result, we we see this. So in this figure, this is the, the blue blue curve is the Raman spectrum from uh, silicon nanowires or nanostructures. And the black curve is the crystalline silicon Raman spectrum. What we see here is that when we go to the nano regime, then uh, the Raman spectrum shifts 
towards the low frequency and it broadens and then it's, it becomes asymmetric. So all these phenomena, if seen in a large spectral range, see, because the spectral range that I show here is only between 490 to 540. So it's a small range, so we can appreciate the asymmetry and the peak shift and broadening. And all these three combined together that now the material has gone from crystalline to the to the amorphous. Sorry, uh, from crystalline to the nanocrystalline. And how much asymmetry, how much shift and how much broadening will be there, that in turn uh, helps us in understanding what could be the size of the nanomaterials presents inside the sample. So this can be done using a different, uh, different samples. And uh, this first paper, uh, this is a small uh, journal, Silicon from Springer, but it has got very good citations in the uh, last uh, uh, four or five years. It's a, it, it gives us the line shape function for this, this uh, nanomaterial without going into a lot of uh, mathematics, but it gives us a very qualitative how the Raman line shape evolves when the material uh, goes from crystalline to nanocrystalline material. Now, what happens is when we say that, okay, asymmetry is caused by uh, quantum confinement effect, which means that the nanomaterial will have an asymmetric Raman line shape. Then the question comes whether uh, quantum confinement is the only region that induces asymmetry in the Raman line shape? The answer is, of course, no. Electron phonon interaction or Fano effect also gives an asymmetry in the Raman line shape. So now this is the thing becomes a bit complicated that, okay, if there is an asymmetry, then how to know whether uh, it has been induced by quantum confinement effect or it is induced by the uh, Fano effect or electron phonon interaction. Also, another uh, constraint, uh, another complication comes because uh, the quantum confinement effect is, is independent of the type of uh, semiconductor used by, for n type and for p type as long as the sizes are uh, very small it will show the similar behavior of asymmetry shift and uh, broadening but depending on whether the system is n type or p type the electron phonon interaction uh, doesn't show the uh, show the, the same behavior in terms of its asymmetry and shift and broadening so then this is this uh, the whole problem becomes very complicated how it happens is that in uh, n type or p type both type of materials the quantum confinement induces a symmetry in the in the lower energy side or lower frequency low, lower wave number side but if the same system has electron phonon interaction also then in the n type system it increases the asymmetry towards the lower energy side but if the system is p type then the asymmetry induced by the electron phonon interaction shows asymmetry in the right hand side or the higher energy side so in a way if a system has both the effects what it does is it uh, it 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 uh, in one case, it compensates the asymmetry, and in other case, it increases the asymmetry. So now, so, since I'm presenting it this way, it looks a bit uh, trivial, but suppose we have a symmetric uh, and broad uh, Raman line shape. It looks very innocent looking uh, uh, Raman line shape, but, and we can say that, okay, there is some temperature increase or some stress or something, but if we look very closely, it means that if this is the blue curve, if you see in the left hand side bottom part, that it looks symmetric and broad, and broad, but it contains both the effects. It so happens that the asymmetry induced by the quantum confinement effect, which is in the low energy side, is compensated by the is compensated by the asymmetry induced by the uh, electron phonon interaction in the uh, higher energy side. So at the particular, uh, uh, if you con convolute, it, convolute it, then you will be able to appreciate that, okay, this had the, had both the, okay. 
so it is like this so then simply only looking at the asymmetry the asymmetry of the raman line shape and broadening it is not very appreciable so we need to do some more uh, closer analysis which in this figure the inset shows this uh, arrow and it shows instead of only a peak it also shows a dip which is also which is known as the anti resonance dip so an asymmetry and broadening and an anti resonance dip it says that uh, it doesn't or not only contains uh, it not only contains uh, uh, quantum confinement effect but also the electron phonon interaction so this one here this uh, picture is very clear that if we do the same experiment for p type and n type uh, nanomaterial then this these the red and blue spectrum both has uh, both the effects the uh, electron phonon interaction also and quantum confinement also so in the red uh, curve we can see that the the, still, the raman spectrum is still asymmetric but in the blue one we see that the asymmetry has got compensated and in a way way it is less as, uh, less asymmetric and asymmetric kind of behavior so if we see a very symmetric or a broad raman spectrum <coughs> that should not be taken uh, very casually but uh, other components needs to be neglected if we wish to uh, do a better better uh, analysis using raman spectroscopy so now all these uh, when i talk about this and when i discuss with students also they give a very good physics to understand but then at the same time uh, this uh, 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 becomes a boring also at times that we looking at the same spectrum and until you love raman spectroscopy is very difficult to appreciate okay the asymmetry has changed and anti resonance has come or something so then with these modern raman spectrometers this uh, raman microscopy or raman uh, mapping also <coughs> uh, is, is 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 there so then what we did so this is the same uh, sample this uh, uh, silicon nanowires prepared on silicon uh, wafer prepared using chemical techniques so we can see these uh, vertically aligned silicon nanowires and actually these are not nanowires these are if you see the scale they are in micrometers they are some 100 uh, nanometers uh, wide uh, wires but actually they consist of uh, even smaller silicon nanostructures of uh, uh, quantum dot like uh, things inside those and if we see the raman spectrum from these see this uh, red curve and the purple curve so purple curve is from a p type uh, crystalline silicon where this asymmetry is only because of the uh, electron phonon interaction and this uh, symmetric looking raman spectrum is from the silicon nanostructures uh, sample this we i already discussed but in these nanowires it is It, we expected that okay these nanowires when we uh, if, if we see this nanowire from the edge of the uh, wafer towards the tip the the sizes present inside that need, need not be the same from the the bottom of the wire to the top of the wire so how to see that so what we did we took raman microscopic image in the cross sectional mode and we analyzed okay let us see how the raman line shape is uh, is is uh, is doing when we move from the edge of the so this part the the part of the wire which is connected to the wafer and the the tip of the the wire so we scan the raman laser from the, the to the uh, whole whole wire and this is the raman image which is on x this is one dimensional image of the line scan which is the raman shift versus the distance on the wire so this uh, top of this wire is the because this uh, is the uh, only crystalline silicon so whatever line shape we see that uh, is is because of the electron phonon interaction but when we move from the wafer towards the tip of the wire we see that the intensity is in the lower uh, energy side is also increasing and there comes a moment around 2 uh, micrometer on the y axis in this raman image where the uh, 
uh, intensities towards the high energy side and the low energy side is, uh, is approximately equal. So that is the point where the Raman line shape starts looking symmetric. So in a way, whatever physics quantum confinement effect and its interplay uh, I discussed is because of the the this interplay and that we act actually can see using Raman microscopy. So physics, we can see that physics. And this is the component of the constituents of the this image that was used to make that uh, image. Similarly, for n-type silicon, uh, we did this uh, microscopy and we see that the asymmetry is only changing in one direction. It is not doing like N the p-type silicon where the asymmetry was earlier in the high energy side, then it becomes symmetric and then it again becomes asymmetric with the more width in the left hand or the lower energy side. So now with this physics, this gave us very a lot of confidence in using Raman microscopy as a tool. And then we, we, uh, we were discussing this problem with uh, one of my colleagues. Actually, this happened when I was uh, dean of this construction infrastructure development. And then my associate dean, he happened to be a civil engineering professor. And we were discussing that uh, is there a technique that can help us in identifying whether the two components of building material and if we mix, whether it can tell whether it got mixed uh, properly or how homogeneously we can mix it. So we use this Raman microscopy to analyze whether the it can tell us how homogeneously the materials have got mixed. So in the left hand side, you see the left hand side bottom. This is the optical image of uh, two uh, waste material from the Dholpur uh, stone and uh, Jaisalmer stone. So in optical microscope, it is very difficult to appreciate. But in the right hand side, you can see that this red part and the green part is very clearly distinguishable because Raman microscope can distinguish the actually based, based on the chemical composition of the material. So Dholpur uh, uh, stone and the Jaisalmer stone has two distinct, one is rich in uh, calcium and one is rich in cal silicon. So it can very clearly distinguish. So we extended it on real mixes, the top, uh, the top left, the top left image is the optical microscopic image of the mix, and the right hand side top uh, is the is the uh, the Raman microscopic image, and these two are the convolution. So it very clearly tells, okay, in how much area, how much uh, is the Dolpur and how much is the uh, is the um, the Jaisalme. So similarly, now we are extending it to. Uh, different uh, materials and this can be used for you if we have a handheld Raman spectrometer this can be used to test the health of these uh, these mixes uh, in situ. So from uh, physics to a uh, civil engineering and in device physics also we did so we make these electrochromic devices. Uh, this is I won't go into the details of these devices but what happens is in these devices, if we apply a bias, it changes uh, changes its color. So now these Dreamliner, the Dreamliner aeroplanes in the windows, these uh, uh, electrochromic devices are uh, there instead of a physical shutter. So these are these uh, these devices that on application of a bias, it changes its color. So to improve these devices, we need to understand what are the mechanism uh, behind the working of these uh, devices. And the Raman spectroscopy is a very good technique that tells, okay, what exactly is happening inside the, the device that is allowing its color to change. So again, these Raman spectrum also tells us the same thing, but a bit boring and uh, needs a lot of attention to understand these. So what we did, whether that can be you uh, understood using Raman microscopy, so answer is again, yes, and it very clearly tells uh, somebody who is not very expert in Raman also tells, okay, yes, it can be used for uh, diagnosis and to understand the mechanism of uh, Raman, uh, mechanism of working of these uh, electrochromic devices. These are all, all recent work. So again, there is uh, the same application of Raman microscopy in, uh, in memory devices. So which is a resistive memory device. I will skip these uh, these data of memory, but yes, this is the Raman microscopic image of uh, the memory one one memory component, 
which shows that yes, in on state and off state and initial state, how the the molecular structure along the device or the along the length of the device it uh, it it varies. So in the the topmost image that shows that the molecules which were responsible for uh, uh, for memory or the the off state of the memory are in one state and when you apply a bias or you write something on the memory device then the whole molecular structure changes and when you erase that the the initial state is restored and in a way then uh, we know that okay the raman microscope can exactly image what is happening inside the material and these are all in situ measurements so it has a very good uh, application. So, Professor Sasa, we I have some time more. No, your time is okay, almost okay. over. Okay. So, so conclude okay. in two minutes. Yeah, that's uh, the one more thing that we discovered was the fan of scattering, which was Raman scattering at low frequency. So it's a uh, main. I want to only say that uh, Raman spectroscopy. If we give a very closer look at the line shape of a Raman spectrum, it can tell us a lot of things about this system. That's the only point I wanted to make here. And this is the same Fano effect in low frequency region. And we named it as a Fano scattering. Instead of Fano effect, we named it as a Raman scattering. And it can tell us about so many things we have heard. I will not go into this analogy. So uh, using that, we could uh, find the, we, we say, we know that these, uh, Non radiative transitions are there, and we could using this Raman, we can have an estimate of what are the non radiative transitions and how do they look. And with this, I will uh, conclude and I will thank again all my students and uh, all my um, all my collaborators, my uh, national and international collaborators, and all funding agencies. Thank you, thank you again, uh, Professor Verman, Professor Sesa. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh Kumar, for a nice presentation. I am seeing Professor B. D. Vankar. I used to meet him in IIT Delhi yes. <laughs> a number of times. Uh, he used to come to BHU also. Raman yes. <laughs> knows yes. it. So our next speaker is Dr. Manoj Kumar Gupta from MPRI, CSIR Lab, Advanced Materials and Process Research Institute. Gopal, we are having memorandum of understanding with this institute also. So uh, he has done, uh, uh, he has hold a DST Inspire faculty fellowship and assistant professor position ACSIR. He is now a scientist at this MPRI and uh, uh, today topic is piezoelectric nanostructures from flexible and transparent nano generator and applications his citations are more than 2800 with h index of 26 i10 index of 31 he has published as many as 47 papers in international journal of repute we used to see uh, his newer and newer paper on Facebook also nowadays. So I request uh, Dr. Manoj Gupta to start his session. Hello, sir, my audio is visible. Yeah, yeah. So good evening, all of you. And uh, I would like to thank Professor Verma and Professor Srinivas to uh, having conducting such a wonderful international conference and giving me the opportunity to present some of my research work. So today I am going to actually I am Manoj Gupta working as a as a scientist at CSIR Empri Bhopal. Basically, we are working in the area of the material science for multifunctional application. So that today. Uh, I will deliver the talk on the particular area of transparent, flexible, and stretchable piezoelectric nano generator. And I will show how this tiny nano generator can produce a huge electrical energy.
so the outline of the talk is i will introduce the fundamental of the piezo electricity nano generator and how to make them flexible and also i would i will discuss about hybrid composite nano generator based on ferroelectric and piezoelectric nano generator and i will also introduce a new kind of the nano generator that can be stretchable and while stretching it can generate electrical energy and if time permit i will also discuss something about triboelectric nano generator so let us start from very basic things called piezoelectric effect we all know actually ki some material can generate electric electric potential when we apply a mechanical stress and because of the non center of symmetry property these material are able to generate electricity in general we have many piezoelectric material let us start from sio2 silicon dioxide zinc oxide in zinc oxide it is a very simple structure hexagonal and uh, in zinc oxide we can just assume that ki relative displacement of the zinc ion with respect to the zinc cation with respect to the oxygen and and i am create electric potential along c axis which gives the piezoelectric effect and also apart from this zinc oxide quartz we have many other piezoelectric material also like barium titanate perovskite material lithium niobate and also some polymer called pvdr pztr piezoelectric and ferroelectric material so i will start with the zinc oxide so what is nano generator actually so basically nano generator is a device that can convert kinetic energy means mechanical energy or thermal energy into the electrical energy so basically this concept is given by professor jongli wang in 2006 what he did he groomed the zinc oxide nano wire on a conducting substrate vertically and he applied a a uh, force uh, a bias from mm -hmm. afm t and he saw that ki once we are applying a pressure from the piezoelectric force microscopy studies through t then negative and positive potential can be generated across the diameter of the zinc oxide nano wires or nano rod and it can it generate few nano ampere current or let us say few nano volt in magnitude so uh, it means if we have vertical aligned zinc oxide nano rods or any other piezoelectric material and if we have a top and bottom conducting electrode then we can make the piezoelectric nano generator in real time so basically in our daily life we are generating we are generating so many mechanical energy and that we are going to waste it every day every day while blood flow exhalation breathing typing walking we generate mechanical energy but there is no such use of this mechanical energy so taking this consideration to how to harvest this mechanical energy using piezoelectric nano generator whether it is possible or not and if possible then we can we can create sufficient uh, electrical energy to power at least tiny devices like uh, light emitting diode lcd and even we can power the many uh, sensor we can build up the self powered nano sensor or nano system and it has also very good application as a pace as a power bank for pacemaker basically in the pacemaker what is happening Uh, it is having a battery any kind of that battery and any patient if they have implanted a pacemaker has to go for a surgery to change the battery that further create uh, surgical operations and uh, create problems so if we are having a alternative of this battery that can power through even circulation of the blood and mechanical pressure that is arising from the blood flow then there is no need to go for multiple surgery to change the pacemaker and and uh, in respect to the battery the piezoelectric nano generator has a longer lifetime and presently even it is having a smaller output how i however i will i have increased the output power but it can work for a longer duration 
and there is no need to charge this nano generator by external electrical energy we can see this video even see if we have a nano generator uh, devices and can be implanted it so through the pressure of the blood flow it can generate electricity also it has good upper potential to use as a flooring while walking talking even by our sound wave we can generate electrical energy so it has a good potential so let us see it means ki our nano generator will be in a such form ki inside uh, between two conducting electrode the nano wire or nano structure will be there and using many various mechanical energy we can convert into electrical energy can be used as a wireless sensor for robot nano sensor mems and see this video this is the from samsung they have recently built uh, fabricated the flexible screen basically but the battery part is still uh, not uh, flexible so our aim is to make a battery flexible in the form of nano generator so what we did actually in in our initial studies we grown the zinc oxide nano wire vertically on the alumina substrate and top one is the gold why gold actually because we need a short key contact at the top surface of the nano uh, zinc oxide nano wire and at the bottom we practically need a ohmic contact so we can have uh, silver are con uh, are conducting uh, substrate so once we apply a mechanical pressure this is the ac type you can see the first peak is coming when we are applying a vertical pressure and when we are releasing this pressure a negative pulse is generating and while and once again applying pressure a positive pulse is coming while releasing a negative pulse is coming and in in this fashion we have a very beautiful ac kind of the electrical uh, electric voltage and magnitude is the 40 millivolt it is quite uh, uh, low and our aim is to increase this value up to in volt uh, in a few volt actually and now uh, actually this zinc oxide is uh, having band gap about 3.37 electron volt and uh, having very uh, high carrier density that can screen the piezoelectric charges so what we have done we done a experiment we applied a uv light along with the pressure then we saw that ki because of the uv light high electrons whole pair are generated generated and they screen out the piezoelectric voltage and the magnitude decreases so this is another problem with the zinc oxide we face so what we did actually in this work in this work we did annealing thermal annealing to passivate the charge carrier density oh ions on the surface and also native defect and uh, while after passivating this native defects we got very high magnitude about 300 millivolt from 440 millivolt to 300 millivolt and also it it is showing good stability in the uv light and this is the working mechanism i am not going in the details and this is the this is the pl spectra we can see after uh, passivation of the negative charge carrier it shows uh, it shows a decrease it decrease uh, in this uh, range green and uh, this uh, green yellow range and a very sharp increase in the uh, uv range and the limitation of this work is it is not flexible basically because the bottom electrode is the alumina substrate al2o3 which is not flexible and this is the see this is the working of the device once we are pressing a peak is coming while releasing a negative peak is generating so the idea is working basically in a real form okay so yeah so in another work so there was many problem with the 
प्रिंसटन जिंक ऑक्साइड लाइट का मेनी पेसिवेशन वी नीड टू डू एंड आल्सो इट हैज ए लो पिजो इलेक्ट्रिक चार्ज कोफिशियंट व्हिच इज प्लेइंग इंपॉर्टेंट रोल इन द इंप्रूविंग द नैनो जनरेटर सो व्हाट वी डिड एक्चुअली वी डिड द वेनेडियम डोपिंग इन जिंक ऑक्साइड नैनो वायर्स एंड बिकॉज वेनेडियम इज अ ट्रांजिशन एलिमेंट एंड इट कैन ऑक्युपाई द जिंक ऑक्साइड साइट एंड कैन स्टैंड इन द फॉर्म ऑफ द वी फाइव प्लस सो in the we choose in itu code is bottom electrode and then using the seed assisted chemical growth we beautifully synthesize the vertical aligned zinc oxide nano sheet basically our idea was to grow the nano rod or nano wire but after the doping the morphology got changed from one dimension to two dimension and also this wa- this nano sheet was well connected together and giving higher mechanical stability this is the cross sectional images we can see this nano sheets are vertically aligned and also showing good crystallinity the work is published in ss nano and this is the we propose why this nano rod is basically converted in the nano sheet form so we discuss that ki because of the high oh ion that can uh, that can uh, uh, attach with the top surface of the zinc surface and control the sin- because of the shielding effect it converted from one dimensional to two dimensional morphology and then the uh, at electronic state of the vanadium we this we uh, discuss with the help of the x-ray photoelectron s- spectroscopy and we confirm that ki v plus v5 plus is uh in uh, occupy in to the zinc uh, oxide lattice in the inside the lattice and v4 plus is at occupied at the surface top surface of the zinc oxide nano sheet then we uh, actually our aim was to increase the piezoelectric charge coefficient so we did the piezoelectric force microscopy of the single zinc oxide nano sheet through piezoelectric force microscopy study you, we can see that he once we are applying a bias through pfm a, a small mechanical deformation is going on the zinc oxide nano sheet and this curve shows that ki d33 means piezoelectric charge coefficient is uh, about 4 picometer per volt it is quite good actually and it also shows the butterfly and hysteresis curve which is basically uh, characteristics of the ferroelectric material but the ferroelectricity uh, in zinc oxide in zinc oxide is a very uh, uh, having very conflict it can also arise from the oxygen's vacancy and other defects so now we made the zinc we made the nano generator using this zinc oxide nano sheet we use the gold uh, as a top electrode and in this case we can see that ki once we are applying a pressure it a peak is coming in the positive direction but peak in the negative direction is missing and only a dc kind of the peaks are coming it means ki since practically actually we need a a dc uh, we need dc output voltage and a electric electrification circuit is required to convert ac circuit into the dc circuit but in this case we don't need any electric electrification circuit and directly we can utilize this dc kind of the output voltage and this dc kind of the output voltage is associated with the uh, vanadium uh, oh ion on the top surface and in the in the nano rod this is ac type in the in the 2d uh, kind of the morphology it is showing the dc type and also the current is very high in micro ampere uh, you can see it is about 1 micro ampere per centimeter square it is good actually and very high now actually there is always a problem to grow the nano wire vertical aligned it is a very sophisticated and also it is not possible with the other perovskite material like pgt barium titanate to grow the nano structure vertically it involve uh, many sophisticated technique so to make it in a very easy way what we did actually we have chosen a zinc silicate nano structures 
एंड वी ग्रोन दिस जिंक सिलिकेट नैनो स्ट्रक्चर बाई सिंपल हाइड्रोथर्मल टेक्निक एंड वी ऑल नो दैट कि दिस हाइड्रोथर्मल ग्रोन नैनो स्ट्रक्चर इज बेसिकली इन द पाउडर फॉर्म एंड नाउ द चैलेंज इज हाउ टू कन्वर्ट दिस नैनो पाउडर इन टू द डिवाइस फॉर्म पर्टिकुलरली फॉर नैनो जेनेटर एप्लीकेशन सो वी ग्रोन दिस जिंक ऑक्साइड नैनो स्ट्रक्चर्स and we did all the characterizations like scm tem and we can see that if this is a nano rod like morphology and it is randomly oriented randomly oriented and we also did the dielectric studies van gap study and we saw that ki dielectric constant is very high because of the nano high uh, creation of the nano dipoles per uh, unit volume so uh, now here again actually actually the basically it forms in the centro symmetric phases ideally but we control the synthesis the non centro symmetric phase for the first time in the zinc silicate nano wires so we need to study also also the piezoelectric force microscope to see what is the d33 value if it is non centro symmetric so we need to find the d33 value so again we did the piezoelectric force microscopy of a single nano wire and we can see this is the amplitude image this is the phase images and uh, this e curve we can see a relation displacement and the applied voltage and a linear trend is coming and that gives d33 about 117 picometer per volt if you remember the d33 in the case of the zinc oxide is only 4 now it is 117 for zinc silicate cases the origin we have discussed and now here our aim was to make the device transparent transparent and also flexible so what we did we we know that ki this graphene is having very high conductivity low sheet resistance high mobility and also it is flexible and the transparent so we grown the graphene by cvd technique in our lab on the copper foil and uh, you can see it is 3 cm by the 3 cm we taken the uh, raman spectroscope it is showing very nice monolayer characteristics this 2d pic um, we can see here but our uh, problem was how to transfer this graphene into the plastic substrate or any flexible substrate so we do the we did this work through the weight transfer method and we each out this copper foil through copper agent copper etching agent and we successfully transfer this graphene on the pet substrate to make the electrode top electrode and see this is the schematic this Uh, actually this zinc oxide nano wires we have dispersed into the pdms polymer through spin coating technique and up, after dispersing it is a basically soft material and flexible material and the top bottom was was the ito and top one was the graphene nano monolayer sheet and we can see this the cross sectional images the nano wires are randomly aligned means the nano dipoles are not in a one direction it is randomly aligned so initially what we did we used the itu electrode as a top electrode we started with the itu so in the case of the itu the output voltage was just 1 volt it is small actually so now in the uh, when the graphene electrode the output voltage was quite high actually once we increased it is uh, even at a small pressure 0.05 kgf the output voltage was 4 volt from millivolt to 4 volt it is very good uh, improvement basically i can say and if we increase the pressure the output voltage is also increasing it means ki it is proportional to the applied force and if you are applying high pressure we can generate high electrical energy and this right graph is showing the switching effect it is because we need to confirm ki whether the output is coming from the device or some instrument 
error is happening so we can see these peaks are switched when we connected positive to negative negative to positive so what what is happening inside the nano generator once we are applying electrical uh, mechanical force due to piezoelectricity positive and negative uh, uh, charges are generated and the electrons are transported from top to bottom side it means a positive peak is coming and once we are releasing the pressure the piezoelectric voltage disappeared and the accumulated electron at the bottom side now started to coming back on the top side which gives the negative pulses so in that way the device is working now see this is the pushing condition once we are applying the vertical pressure what happen if we bend the device because it is flexible na so in the case of the bending condition also it is generating 2 volt magnitude even it means small mechanical vibration can also generate electricity we can fix this material even on our mobile phone as a screen guard and just tap it and connect a battery bottom side and we can store these charges into that capacitor and that can be further utilized for power generation and this and also this so this study shows the durability whether the device is durable or not so you can see about 500 cycles it is showing a very uniform current density no degradation is coming it means it is also showing the good durability it is durable and the nano wires are not breaking down inside the devices and the and the conversion energy conversion efficiency is about 29.1 0% and uh, this is the some further work what we are doing we are trying to make the rollable graphene at the bottom side also and graphene at the top side also and the similar kind of the work we also did with the zinc stannate zinc stannate is also a very um, good uh, piezoelectric materials so in the previous work you have seen that the nano dipoles are randomly oriented right so it means ki we need to align the nan align the nano dipoles in a one direction so in this work what we did we grown the nano cubes actually the symmetry will be very high and in a similar fashion the zinc stannate was dispersed into the pdms polymer and gold was used as a top electrode and in this case what we did actually we kept the device on the road and we used the vehicle tire over the nano generator to see whether charge is uh, generating or not so initially we did the uh, work we applied the force we saw the variation of the piezoelectric charges and also with the concentration ki whether increasing concentration of the zinc stannate in the ptms matrix will affect the output power or not so it is showing good value up to the 40% and then it is start decreases because of the increasing the um, conductivity in the inside the pdms matrix and one of the beautiful thing is that ki it do not required any electrical pulling to align the dipoles in a single direction without electrical pulling it gives the electricity and this is also covered in the cover piece this we can see here the device is kept on the road and once the vehicle we are moving with the vehicle tires we we are achieving about 12 volt it is very enough to power the lcd or led this is the switching test you can see in the nano voltmeter the pulses are coming and also scaling is possible we can scale up this process because of the uh, easy process to tune the grow the nano materials similarly in a, another work what we did actually in dr gupta yes sir you got about a minute to wrap it up uh, two minutes sir yeah two minutes okay 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 thank you sir 
so in the another work we we grown the nano disk vertically on the itu substrate and we and we utilize the carbon nanotube as a top electrode and we have achieved up to 20 volt recently this work is also published so we practically we always improving the output voltage and making the device meaningful and in the, this is the perovskite material we have utilized we achieved up to 48 volt and in this work this is the stretchable nano generator we use the pdm pvdf polymer as a piezoelectric material graphene as a top electrode cnt as a bottom electrode and this and using the pyroelectricity concept we have converted not only mechanical energy but also the thermal energy simultaneously so in this way we integrated both the energy together and we achieved the uh, high output voltage this is also featured as a uh, this is the powering the led if we can easily power the led maybe one it will come yeah so i will quickly uh, pack up and uh, this is the this is the work we did uh, basically in the postdoc we integrated the solar cell with the piezoelectricity in a one device itself means we can convert light energy as well as the mechanical energy together having a single device and also we have improved the solar solar cell efficiency you can see this video this is under the under the solar cell solar light and once we apply the pressure the output was increasing means simultaneously we can harvest solar energy as well as mechanical energy i think uh, i have done it few of the work uh, i have not discussed so thank you very much sir and i will be highly thankful to my phd scholar who worked hard to get these results thank you sir thank you dr manoj kumar gupta for nice presentation uh, our next speaker is uh, your screen. Uh, okay. okay, okay. Next speaker is <clears throat> from South Korea, Jeon Buk National University. Dr. Vijay Kumar Singh is presently working as a postdoc fellow. Uh, he has done PhD from uh, Department of Physics Institute of Science (BHU). Uh, he was awarded Inspire Faculty Fellowship uh, by Government of India. His research interest uh, is synthesis of novel nanomaterials for biosensing, metal ion sensing, energy conversion, and storage applications. His citation is 189, H index 5, I10 index 3, he has published 14 papers in International Journal of Repute. So, uh, I now I request uh, Dr. V.K. Singh to start his lecture. Uh, thank you, Professor Verma, sir, for this nice introduction. Uh, I, sin I sincerely thank uh, Professor uh, Sesa sir and all the organizing committee of the IWMSC 2020 for uh, giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity to share my research work with the wonderful audience uh, through this online platform in the tough time of COVID pandemic. Uh, let me share my uh, presentation. So today I will discuss about the novel 2D, 0D and hybrid nanomaterials, its synthesis, characterization and applications. Outline of my presentation is, uh, I will discuss three important um, PhD works. First will be CVD synthesis of atomically thin graphene and its application as a biosensing platform for detection of cancer biomarker CEA. Second one will be the growth parameters, electrical and optical behavior study of 2D tungsten disulfide. 
and third one will be the UV photo detector based on 0D 2D hybrid structure of WS2 quantum dot with graphene. I will discuss all the uh, these work in details so the young audience can get uh, the much more information about my works. So basically, my work is on nanomaterials. So I will briefly describe here what are the nanomaterials. So based on the quantum confinement, all the existing material can be classified as follows. If all the three dimensions of a material are uh, greater than the characteristic length scales, then material is known as classical or bulk material. Here density of state shows parabolic behavior. When one of the dimension of a material becomes comparable to the characteristic length scale, then material is known as 2D materials. Here, density of state shows stair-like behavior. And when two dimensions of a material become comparable to the characteristic length scale, then these kind of materials are known as 1D materials. And density of state shows spike-like behavior. And if all the three dimensions of a material becomes comparable to the characteristic length scales, then such kind of material are known as quantum dot material. And in this case, density of state shows atomic like spectra. In, in this, uh, I have worked on 2D material and 0D material, which will be discussed in the coming slides. So coming to the 2D material, there are uh, materials which are atomically thin and expanded in two dimensions are known as 2D material. Followed by the discovery of graphene in 2004, several 2D materials have been explored. Presently, 2D material can serve whole the electronic materials ranging from insulator to superconductor. From this library of 2D material, we have chosen graphene, which is semi-metal in nature, and uh, WS2, which is semiconductor in nature, uh, which will be discussed in the coming slides. And 0D quantum dots are another interesting class of material. These materials are also known as artificial or synthetic atoms. When all the dimensions of a material com are comparable to the Bohr exciton radius defined by this relation, then material is known as quantum dot. In case of WS2, on which I have worked, it is 1.23 nanometer. The beauty of such kind of material is that they source uh, size dependent band gap. And the uh, beauty of these materials is that when they are optically excited, they selectively absorb particular wavelength of light and shows the size dependent fluorescence behavior. And these material due to their unique optical properties can be used for several potential applications like a light emitting diode, as photosensitizer, as a bioimaging probe, as a metal ion sensor, etc. Uh, I will discuss a WS2 quantum dot as a photosensitizer. So coming to the first work, which is CVD synthesis of atomically thin graphene and its application as a biosensing platform for detection of cancer biomarker CEA. This work is published in Biosensor and Bioelectronics. So question here is why we wanted to detect CEA. So CEA is very important cancer biomarker. Normal level of CEA in healthy human serum is less than 2.5 nanogram per ml, and in uh, heavy smokers, it is around 5 nanogram per ml. However, in patients suffering from stomach cancer, lung cancer, liver cancer, etc., concentration of CEA got increased. So, sensitive and accurate detection of CEA could lead to the diagnosis of cancer at its early stage. However, presently used techniques like ELISA and colony counting methods are tedious and time consuming. On the other hand, bioelectrode based biosensor offers rapid and sensitive measurements. As uh, Professor uh, Kosik sir already discussed more about the biosensor, so biosensor has two important components. One is bioreceptor made up of in, uh, immobilized enzymes and Another one is the biocompatible layer, which is used to bound the bioreceptors. In last few years, several uh, nanomaterials have been used as a bioreceptors like graphene oxide, reduced graphene oxide, etc. 
However, the limitation of these material is that they require costly supporting substrates such as glassy carbon electrode, ITO, gold foil, etc. as well as they require binder like mafia which reduce the, degrades the material property also. So what could be the solution? Solution may be graphene. Graphene is a single layer of carbon atom, sp2 hybridized carbon atom arranged in honeycomb like glass space. Graphene offers many exceptional properties like its young modulus is very high, its charge mobility is of the order of 10 to the power 5, its specific surface area is very high. Among these properties, its charge mobility and high specific surface area could be used for a biosensor. But the challenging task is now, for any potential application, a large-scale eco-friendly and cost-effective synthesis of graphene is required. For this purpose, graphene could be synthesized through mechanical exfoliation, chemical exfoliation, etc. But in case of mechanical exfoliation, yield is very less. And in case of chemical exfoliation, quality of graphene is very poor. So, we have adopted liquid precursor based CVD synthesis of graphene, uh, which, is, which was in uh, my PhD lab. So briefly, a copper foil used as a growth substrate was inserted into the quartz tubular furnace and the temperature of furnace was raised up to 1000 degrees Celsius. Here, an hexane was used as a precursor for the carbon atom and hydrogen gas was used to uh, make the inert atmosphere as well as reducing atmosphere for the growth of graphene into the, uh, onto the uh, copper foil. So to characterize uh, the graphene, this graphene and copper substrate need to be transferred uh, onto the particular substrate like for TEM imaging on TEM grid or for optical imaging in the, on the Silicon, silicon oxide substrate. So we adopted the polymer assisted transferring method. The schematic shows how graphene was transferred from the copper substrate to the silicon silicon oxide substrate. This uh, square patch shows the graphene layer on silicon silicon oxide substrate. Next, we used this uh, graphene uh, to see the quality of graphene. We performed the Raman spectroscopy. In the Raman spectrum, we observed three important bands, D, G, and 2D, where D and 2D band correspond to the in-plane breathing of carbon rings, and uh, G band correspond to the in-plane stretching of carbon-carbon uh, bond. So mostly we found that 2D band was much intense than G band. This is the signature of single layer graphene. And next, we use this graphene as a biosensing platform uh, on copper substrate. This is schematic shows how the uh, uh, bioelectrode was fabricated. So to uh, functionalize the graphene, uh, the graphene copper electrode was immersed into the PVSC linker solution. In this step, PVSC linker was attached through graphene by forming pi pi bond. And to make this bioelectrode specific for detection of CEA, this PBSC graphene copper electrode was immersed in antibody solution of CEA. In this step, antibody was attached through the PBSC linker by forming amide bond. Next, we have uh, used this bioelectrode for detection of CEA. The electrochemical response of uh, our bioelectrode is shown here from this uh, response, we can see that the charge transfer resistance of the bioelectrode increases with the successive addition of CEA. And the charge transfer resistance got saturated after the concentration of CEA 25 nanogram per ml. And the semi logarithmic plot shows that the charge transfer resistance is linear up to 25 nanogram per ml from 1 to 25 nanogram per ml. So we can say that this uh, fabricated biosensor is linear up to 25 nanogram per ml. And limit of detection was found to be 0.23 nanogram per ml using this relation. 
So we can say that this uh, bioelectrode could be used for detection of CEA up to 0.23 nanogram per ml. So summary of this work is that for the very first time as synthesized graphene on copper substrate has been used as a bioelectrode material for detection of CEA, which does <coughs> not demand any further tedious transferring process. And due to the high sensitivity, specificity, and ease of fabrication, this bioelectrode could be used for clinical diagnosis of cancer at its early stage. Now coming to the second work, which is growth parameter electrical and optical behavior study of 2D tungsten disulfide. And this work uh, is published in Applied Material Interfaces. The motivation behind this work is that, as I have discussed in uh, last work, graphene is a very good material. However, it is not universal material for all the applications. Graphene has a limitation of zero band gap, which limits its application as a channel material in 2D field effect transition, transistor. So why we need 2D field effect transistor? So we, knew, uh, we know that miniaturization of electronic gadgets requires a smaller and a smaller chips. And as the chips become smaller, the current silicon-based 3D FETs fails because they show short channel effect. On the other hand, 2D field effect transistor made from 2D semiconducting nanomaterials are free from short channel effect because all the electrons are confined in naturally atomically thin channels. So the key to the solution of this is 2D semiconducting nanomaterial. In this regard, transition metal dichalcogenide have been severely explored in last few years. So what is transition metal dichalcogenide? Its general formula is MX2, where M stands for transition metal and X stands for chalcogen atoms. Depending on the different combination of metal and chalcogen atoms, TMD's family have several members like MOS2, MOSC2, WS2, etc. Among uh, this family, we have chosen WS2, which is a layered material similar to graphite, and each layer is bonded with the other layer through the weak van der Waal force, which allows the easy exfoliation of this material into single layer. And a single layer of WS2 consists of three sublayers, where central layer of metal atom is sandwiched between the two layer of chalcogen atoms. There are two polymorphs of WS2. One is trigonal prismatic, and another one is trigonal antiprismatic. If we see that this from top, it looks like hexagon, and if we see the this trigonal antiprismatic polymorph, it looks like to interpenetrating hexagon. The beauty of this material is that when this material is thinned down from multi-layer to monolayer, this material is converted from indirect band gap to the direct band gap, which is good for optoelectronic devices. So this high-end expectation demands a facile and large-scale synthesis of monolayer WH2. Keeping this in mind, WS2 could also be synthesized through mechanical exfoliation or chemical exfoliation. But here again, in case of mechanical exfoliation, yield is very less. And in case of chemical exfoliation, quality is very poor. So we adopted atmospheric pressure chemical vapor deposition um, technique. Uh, this is the furnace, which uh, has the facility of three zone furnace, which is three zone furnace where Temperature of each zone can be controlled independently. In brief, sulfur and tungsten oxide used as a precursor for WS2 were kept in zone 1 and zone 2. And silicon silicon oxide vapor used as a growth substrate was put on the aluminum board containing tungsten oxide. And argon gas is used to create the inert atmosphere in the growth zone as well as for carrying the precursor into the growth chamber. There are several key factors which uh, hinders the good quality growth of WS2, like its pressure of the growth chamber, precursor amount, control of the temperature of different zones. 
So we did a lot of experiment and optimize these growth parameters. And after the optimization, we got such a beautiful triangular morphology growth of WS2. We can see from this optical image. And the maximum lateral size of as grown WS2 was 40 micrometer. Same image again showing the uh, triangular morphology growth of WS2. And this is the optimized growth parameter for the WS2. To confirm the number of layer and quality of graphene, uh, as Professor Rajesh sir told, Raman spectroscopy is a very versatile technique, simple and very versatile technique. So we perform Raman spectroscopy. In the Raman spectrum, two important band of WS2 has been observed where E2G1 band correspond to the in-plane vibration of tungsten and sulfur atom and A1G band correspond to the out-of-plane vibration of tungsten and sulfur atom. In this case, we observed that E2G1 was much more pronounced than A1G band. So this is the signature of monolayer WH2. To confirm the same, we also performed the atomic force microscopy. This is the AFM image of, monolayer, uh, of WS2 and the high difference between the silicon substrate and uh, WS2 crystal of one nanometer clearly suggests the growth of monolayer WS2. To see the optical property of edge grown WS2 crystal, we perform the absorption spectroscopy. In the absorption spectrum, three absorption bands, A, B, C, have been observed, where A and B correspond to the direct excitonic transition at K point and C band correspond to the intervalley transition. To see the uh, optical performance, we also perform the PL imaging. This is the PL map of uh, WS2 crystal. From this, we can see that at the edges, PL is very sharp. And as we move from the edge to the center and the number of layer increases, the PL intensity decreases and the shifted toward the higher wavelength. And this again confirms that the single layer WS2 is direct band gap in nature. And as the number of layer increases, the material converted into the indirect band gap. Further, we observed that we performed the fluorescence microscopy. And we observed that under the exposure of green light, this WS2 crystal at edges gives very strong red fluorescence. And in the, a, in the center where number of layer is increased, the fluorescence is so much decreased that it could not be imaged under the given exposure condition. So from here, we can say that monolayer WS2 gives very strong red fluorescence under the exposure of green light. Next, we use this uh, edge grown WS2 crystal as a channel material in field effect transistor. So before moving to my result, I will briefly describe here what is a field effect transistor. A field effect transistor is a three terminal device having gate, source and drain. There is a semiconductor layer, dielectric layer and three terminals, gate, source and drain. There are two important characteristics of a typical and channel field effect transistor. One is output, output characteristics. It should show linear region, saturation region, as well as the gate field effect. And the important parameters of a field effect transistor like field effect mobility and current on off ratio is calculated from the transfer characteristics. So this shows the schematic uh, how field effect transistor was fabricated. Edge grown uh, WS2 crystal uh, was transferred on the alumina coated silicon silicon of sub substrate using the polymer assisted transferring method and then source drain contact were deposited on this um, device. This is the schematic of device showing the WS2 crystal as a channel material. The channel length uh, of the device was 100 nanometer and channel width was 10 micrometer. 
Output characteristics of our field effect transistor clearly showing the linear region, saturation region, as well as the gate field effect. Uh, and the field effect mobility uh, and the current on off ratio of the order of 10 to power 6 obtained from the transfer characteristics clearly suggests that it is sufficient enough for digital electronic applications. The field effect mobility, which is a very important parameter in case of field effect transistor, was calculated using this relation, and it is obtained on the order of six centimeter square per volt per second, which is good enough for 2D field effect transistor. So, in summary, uh, of this work is that the optimized growth parameter like precursor amount, gas flow rate, temperature, etc., held monolayer WS2 crystal. And the monolayer WS2 gives very strong red emission. However, emission intensity certainly decreases as the number of layer is increased. And the FET characterization reveals that the edge produced WS2 crystal can be used as a channel material in 2D field effect transistor. Now moving to the third work, which is UV photo detector based on 0D 2D hybrid structure of WS2 quantum dot with graphene. This work was published in ACS Applied Nanomaterial. So uh, motivation behind this work uh, is that photo detectors is a device which converts lights into electrical signal. Depending on different electromagnetic uh, radiation, photo detectors can have different applications, like for pollution detection, imaging, bioimaging, chemical analysis, etc. The graphene, single layer graphene, has another limitation, is of limited optical absorption. Graphene can only absorb 2.3% of light, which is a bottleneck in developing graphene-based photo detectors. If we develop graphene-based photo detectors, it shows very low responsivity on the order of milliampere per watt. However, the responsivity of graphene could be modified, uh, could be enhanced by modifying its surface with semiconducting WS2 quantum dot, which strongly interacts with UV light. Thus, a hybrid structure of WS2 quantum dot with graphene can give highly responsive ultra-thin photo detector uh, in which light absorption and carrier transportation may be realized in WS2 quantum dot and graphene respectively. Keeping this in mind, we synthesized uh, WS2 quantum dot through hydrothermal technique. Uh, in brief, sodium tungstate and l cysteine were uh, mixed in DI water under the magnetic stirring condition, and the solution was put for hydrothermal reaction at 200 degrees Celsius for 36 hours. And after the completion of reaction, we got yellowish solution containing WS2 quantum dot. The chemical reaction involved is like this one, and this. This uh, schematic shows how photo detector device was fabricated. A graphene grown on copper substrate, which I have already discussed in my previous work, were transferred using polymer assisted transfer method on the silicon silicon oxide substrate. And then silver contacts on graphene were made through RF sputtering of silver. And finally, WS2 quantum dot was spin coated on the, this structure. This is the schematic of photo detector device, and this is the digital photograph of our photo detector device. The AFM image of WS2 quantum dot uh, graphene system shows the graphene layer having WS2 quantum dot dispersed over the graphene layer. And then we check the optical performance of this device and we observe that from the IV response of photo detector, we can see that under the dark light, there is no response of photo detector. And when the photo detector device was illuminated with the UV lamp of 365 nanometer, then 
a huge contrast ratio in uv and dark current was found of the order of 20 22 and we also performed the temperature dependent iv response of photo detector and we observed that a very little change was found in the current value so a small change in photo current clearly shows the stability of device at higher temperature the photo responsivity and detectivity of photo detector was also calculated using this relation and from this plot of responsivity and photo detectivity with the wavelength of light we can see that the photo detector mostly respond into the uv region and the photo detectors gives a high responsivity of 1840 ampere per watt and detectivity of the order of 10 to power 12 joules respectively for 365 nanometer UV light at an applied bias of 5 volt. We also did the time response study of the photo detector and the rise time which is defined as a time uh, for a pulse rise from 10% to 90% was obtained on the order of 2.04 second and the fall time was 2.89 second which is uh, uh, good enough but uh, this is not uh, up to the mark. We need to uh, improve the device system so that this uh, response time could be little lower. And this uh, shows the uh, photo detector response mechanism. Uh, figure B showing the band structure of graphene and WS2 quantum dot under the thermal equilibrium this graphene and WS2, the Fermi level of this graphene and WS2 will be aligned. And when the uh, this system photo detector system is optically excited, a large number of electron and whole pair will be generated into the WS2 quantum dot. And this electron is transferred to the graphene and swept to the electrode with the help of graphene, giving rise to the UV current. So this is the basic mechanism of uh, response of, of photo detection. So in summary, limitation of graphene, which is a, a light absorption property of 2.3% only, is overcome by making hybrid structure of WS2 quantum dot with graphene. The photo detector exhibited very high responsivity of 1840 ampere per watt and excellent photo detectivity of 7.47 into 10 power 12 zones. And our finding advocates that hybrid structure of WS2 quantum with graphene is a prospective candidate for high performance optoelectronic devices. So this is all for today. And finally, I would like to acknowledge uh, at this platform my uh, PhD supervisors, Professor R.S. Tiwari and Professor Anshal Srivastava, who helped me in working all these works and uh, Professor Sunjun Park, who is my postdoc advisor, and finally my research collaborators, uh, Professor B.D. Malhotra sir, and Dr. Saptarshi Das sir, and Dr. Amritansu Foundation. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. V.K. Singh, for very nice presentation. Our last speaker for today is Dr. Himansu Misra, also a PhD from BHU uh, Institute of Science, postdoc researcher presently uh, at the Department of Physics and Astronomy, Upasla University, Sweden. His research interest includes novel 2D materials and their application in a sprintonics, optoelectronics, and flexible nano devices. His citation is almost 102 with H index of 5. I10 index of two. He has published 17 papers so far in International Journal of Repute. So with this, I request Dr. Imansu Misra to start his lecture. Dr. Uh, Imansu. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much uh, to Professor Varma, sir. And uh, I'm uh, thankful to all, all the organizing committee and all the panelists to, uh, to provide a platform to, uh, to put my research work so uh, I'm going to share my screen. No. 
So uh, today I'm going to discuss uh, about the synthesis, characterization, and applications of fluorescent molybdenum disulfide, that is MOS2 nanostructures. Today, all the work that I will discuss, uh, these are the, my PhD work, did at uh, BHU under the supervision of uh, Professor Anchas Vastasa. So first of all, uh, uh, I'll brief my outlines that uh, today I'm going to discuss. First of all, I will discuss this uh, quantum confinement, but uh, in a few lines, as uh, already Dr. Vijay has discussed uh, all the things. And uh, then I will come to the history of the quantum dots, how the research of quantum dots evolves, how it is started, and then uh, how MOS2 uh, quantum dots uh, came into uh, come into light, that uh, people started uh, doing research in MOS2 quantum dots, why, why, and uh, then how we prepared the quantum dots of MOS2 in our lab and uh, we did all the characterizations. And finally, uh, I will uh, discuss the discuss my findings during my PhD. That is uh, how your MOS2 quantum dots can be used for pH sensing, for uh, bio application like in vivo bioimaging and uh, in last for metal ion sensing. So uh, earlier as a professor, uh, Dr. Vijay has discussed that uh, in a, a structure having at least one of its dimension in nanometer range is uh, classified as nanostructures. So uh, here I've shown the four uh, diagrams. One is 3D structure, 2D structure, 1D structure, and 0D structure. The classification of these nanostructures depends upon the confinement uh, provided to the motion of electron. If electrons are free to move in all the three directions, then uh, we're left with the classical bodies like uh, 3D structures. If the motion of the electron is confined into two direction, uh, or confined in one direction, and the electron is free to move in two directions, then we had uh, 2D structures. Quantum wells are the uh, example of this uh, 2D structure. And uh, if the motion of the electron is confined from two directions and is free to, uh, free to move in one direction, then we're left with uh, 1D structure. CNTs uh, or any nano wire, nano rods are the example of this, uh, uh, this 1D structure. And finally, if uh, motion of electron is confined in all the three directions, which is the extreme case, then we're left with the 0D structures. And quantum dots are the best example of these 0D uh, structures. So uh, today, uh, I will discuss uh, this 0D uh, structure. So an example of 0D uh, structures are quantum dots. So if the uh, a, a size of a quantum dot is uh, comparable to its four excitonic radius, and the fascinating thing about the quantum dots are its color tunability as a function of its shape, size, and uh, surface environment. And uh, due to its uh, small size and uh, low cytotoxicity and better biocompatibility, these quantum dots are uh, suitable for uh, bio applications. So, so uh, history of the quantum dots uh, starts uh, in 1980 when uh, a Russian uh, physicist Alexei Ikomo observed the nanocrystals of uh, copper chloride and cadmium saladide in molten glass matrix and uh, published a paper. And then the, the research community got interested in the research of quantum dots by, uh, by a theory provided by Alexander Ifros which relates the size dependency of these quantum dots with the emission property of the quantum dots. And finally, it was uh, further evolutionized by, revolutionized by Louis Bruce. So if, uh, if, we, uh, if, we, uh, if we try to find that uh, how these quantum dots uh, get revolutionized in the different parts of the world, so we can classify it, uh, these in three parts. How, how these uh, uh, quantum dot research is evolutionized uh, in Europe. That was done by Professor Arnim Henglin. And uh, then in Asia, it was started by Professor Tadasi Ito, Japan. And uh, in USA, quantum dot research started with L. Bruce. So as I told that uh, the fascinating property of quantum dots are its uh, size dependent uh, Tunability. Color tunability means uh, if we excite uh, a, a quantum dot with uh, some suitable wavelength, then they start emitting uh, some color of light. So, 
So uh, uh, considering the, considering all these things, the people started looking for a quantum dot, which is uh, more fluorescent, which uh, emits a high intensity of color. So research is just started in the field of cadmium, uh, cadmium based quantum dots like uh, CDSC, CDT, CDS, et cetera. But uh, while uh, looking for the applications of these uh, cadmium based quantum dots, uh, people fail to apply those quantum dots for bio application due to the toxic nature of cadmium. So people started looking for uh, cadmium free quantum dots and uh, several quantum dots like silicon quantum dots, graphene quantum dots, and uh, transition metal dichalcogenides such as MOS2, WS2, and HBN quantum dots are, uh, are uh, uh, are found out. So today uh, I'll focus on cadmium free quantum dots, among which I will discuss this MOS2 quantum dots. So first of all, uh, I'll discuss uh, what is this MOS2, what is its uh, crystal structure, and what is its property. So MOS2 is a uh, is a compound which uh, put, uh, which put a flagship in uh, transition metal dichalcogenides family. Uh, as uh, Dr. Vijay told that. Uh, uh, transition metal dichalcogenides family had a layered structure where a metal layer is sandwiched between two chalcogen layers. Like uh, in MOS2, one molybdenum layer is sandwiched between two sulfur layers, one upper sulfur layers and one is in down sulfur layers. So the bulk structure of uh, MOS2 is uh, basically uh, have a number of layers of uh, this uh, arrangement. So uh, if we'll see a, a single layer of this MOS2, it has in-plane uh, covalent bonding between uh, molybdenum and sulfur atoms. But if we uh, took the, a number of layers of MOS2, other layers, the one layer is uh, uh, attached with the other layer with a weak Van der Waal uh, force. So the fascinating property of this uh, TMDs, uh, these TMDs are their layer dependent band gap transition. Uh, transition such as in case of MOS2, uh, uh, for, a, for bulk MOS2, it is of indirect band gap having 1.2 electron volt. But if we thin it to a monolayer, it shows a direct band gap nature of 1.8 electron volt. The MOS2 or any uh, TMD family exists in uh, two polymorph for its uh, monolayer. Uh, but if we we'll consider uh, its bulk structure, there is another polymorph called uh, 3R. This is that is a rhombohedral structure. So here I've shown just only for uh, monolayers. The, the the here I've shown the top view of a 2H polymorph. The uh, the uh, the property of this polymorph is the, that it is of semiconducting nature, and the 1T polymorph it is of this uh, metallic nature. So uh, if we'll uh, see uh, on top of this uh, monolayer, we'll find that there are hexagon patterns of alternative car uh, alternative molybdenum and sulfur atoms. While in case of 1T polymorph, there are two hexagon structures interpenetrating to each other. So, as I said, that uh, MOS2 or any transition metal dichalcogenide family has a fascinating property of uh, band gap tunability. So, this band gap tunability lead to uh, lead, uh, lead to indirect to direct band gap transition, and uh, it provides a fluorescence emission. So. Uh, reports are also uh, reports are available that uh, 2D structure of MLS to provide a fluorescence, and uh, also if uh, fluorescence due to this band gap transition. But the other way to generate a fluorescence in uh, this MLS is confinement of its size confinement in all the three direction that is its uh, quantum dot structure. So uh, today uh, today I will discuss about this uh, MLS to quantum dot. So here I have listed a number of ways. Through which we can prepare this uh, MOS2 quantum dots. Uh, we have uh, divided all the synthesis methods in uh, two parts. One is top down method, and another one is bottom up uh, method. The top down method includes chemical exfoliation, mechanical exfoliation, electrochemical method, emulsion, and thermal ablation. While bottom up method, the, most, the mostly used methods are solvothermal and hydrothermal. So I'll discuss this hydrothermal method, which uh, I've used during my PhD to prepare these uh, MOS2 quantum dots. Uh, further, uh, the, there are different applications of these uh, MOS2 quantum dots. It's, uh, it, uh, if it is in a 1H, uh, 1, 1T polymorph, it could be used as electrocatalytic activity. It has bioimaging application. It's a, uh, it's as a fluorescence based sensing. It could be used in lithium storage of uh, batteries. 
and uh, it has photocatalytic uh, hydrogen evolution it has gas sensing properties and uh, it has a uh, it could be used for uh, photo degradation of organic dyes so today i'll discuss uh, its application as a bioimaging probe and it's a fluorescence bed sensing that is the ph sensing and metal ion sensing so uh, i'll discuss first uh, uh, ms2 quantum dot as a ph sensor this work uh, is published in advanced optical material so why we are so concerned about this uh, ph sensing so because uh, the uh, the ph of our body uh, tells us about uh, the health uh, tells us about the health of our body ph sensors are uh, really important for monitoring the ph evolution uh, during the growth and metabolism of several diseases in our body here uh, i have shown a picture where uh, i have shown a human body and uh, i made uh, two scaling one is acidic and one is alkaline if your body has some acidic property your body will lead to a sickness if your body has some alkaline property then your body is uh, said to be healthy like uh, like this i have also shown here the two uh, pictures this is the image of a normal pancreas having the ph of 7.4 uh, which is uh, which is the normal ph of our body but if there is a cancer pancreatic cancer the the ph of the uh, pancreas get down and it is around 5 and uh, the other thing is that uh, the commercial available ph sensors uh, are uh, failed to monitor these things this in situ things so uh, we tried to synthesize this uh, ms2 quantum dots and uh, used uh, used uh, this ms2 quantum dots uh, as a ph sensor so we have uh, used a hydrothermal method to synthesize these quantum dots the reagents used for these uh, quantum dots are sodium molybdate and l16 these are the amount for in the quantum dot sodium molybdate is a 0.25 g in 25 ml of water and l16 is 0.5 g in 25 ml of water and then by adding the uh, 0.1 molar hcl we maintain the ph of this solution uh, around 6.5 and uh, we put for hydrothermal reaction for 200 degrees celsius for 36 hours and uh, we get uh, a, a light yellowish uh, solution which is which contains the mos2 quantum dot here i've shown uh, two pictures this is the picture uh, under visible light of the synthesized quantum dots but if we we'll excite uh, this uh, quantum dot with uh, a uv light of a 365 nanometer wavelength we get uh, this uh, cyan color uh, fluorescence so this this is the possible hydrothermal reaction that is occurring during this hydrothermal reaction so synthesized ms2 quantum dots have been characterized uh, structurally by tem uh, and hrtm this atm micrograph shows a uniform dispersion of uh, ms2 quantum dots having an average uh, particle size of 6 nanometer and the structure of ms2 is confirmed uh, by 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 doing a hrtm with a interlayer spacing of 0.27 nanometer corresponding to one oo plane of ms2 Uh, uh further we tried to find out that whether our synthesized quantum dots are uh, few layer or mono layer what is the thickness of our ms2 quantum dots so we performed afm uh, wavefm characterization and here in the afm picture you can uh, again see the uniform dispersion of ms2 quantum dots and uh, the height profiling of these quantum dots shows that uh, an average height size of uh, 7 nanometer which tells that these quantum dots are multi layer in nature to so further uh, confirm the structure we did uh, some uh, we, we did microdamon of these uh, ms2 quantum dots uh, like a graphene ms2 also has some characteristic uh, peaks uh, named as uh, e2g uh, e2 e1g and a1g e2g is the in plane vibration of molybdenum and sulfur atoms while a1g is the out of plane vibration of sulfur atom while uh, molybdenum atom remains constant So in our case, uh, we have compared the Raman spectra of MOS2 quantum dots with uh, bulk MOS2, and uh, for bulk MOS2, we observe two uh, characteristic Raman peaks: one at uh, 375 centimeter inverse, and uh, another one at uh, 403 centimeter inverse. While in case of uh, MOS2 quantum dots, uh, this uh, E2G Uh, peak arise at uh, 376 cm inverse and this a1g peak at uh, 402 so the another uh, the another technique to determine the thickness of uh, thickness of this uh, uh, mos2 is uh, the separation between the e2g and a1g peaks 
if we will uh, if we will subtract uh, these the position of these two peaks, we we left with uh, 28 centimeter inverse for uh, bulk uh, MOS2 and 26 centimeter inverse for this uh, MOS2 quantum dot. For monolayer MOS2, uh, this uh, separation this uh, separation of E2G and A1G is around 20 centimeter inverse. But if the separation is more than that, then definitely uh, you have a multi-layer structure of this MOS2. So in our case for uh, MOS, uh, for quantum dots, it is 26 centimeter inverse. So it is again confirmed that uh, our quantum dots are multi-layer in nature. So we, we investigated the photophysical properties of our synthesized MOS2 quantum dots. We took the we recorded the absorption spectrum for our MOS2 quantum dots, and we found that. Uh, that there's a band around 300 nanometer and one at 370 nanometer uh, regard, uh, regarding the absorption of uh, this MOS2 quantum dot. We also performed the uh, excitation dependent emission spectrum of this uh, MOS2 quantum dot. We excite our MOS2 quantum dots with uh, different uh, excitation wavelengths and we recorded their PL emission. Interestingly, we found that uh, there are two pronounced uh, emission band one at 14 nanometer and another one is 460 nanometer. There is a report uh, by Wong and Ni. They reported that this, this uh, 460 nanometer, uh, this 460 nanometer band uh, is PL band is pH insensitive. But we want to uh, we want to test our MOS2 for uh, this uh, pH sensitivity. So we we, we focused over this uh, 14 nanometer to confirm. Uh, to confirm this uh, uh, 460 and 40 nanometer uh, band uh, occurrence, we, we did this uh, PL excitation and PL emission spectrum. We recorded this PL uh, excitation spectrum uh, for a 320 nanometer of excitation wavelength and we obtained an emission wavelength of, uh, sorry, sorry, we recorded this uh, emission, uh, the PLE spectrum for emission wavelength of 14 nanometer and we obtained an excitation wavelength of 320 nanometer while for uh, this uh, 320 uh, nanometer excitation we obtain an emission wavelength of uh, 14 nanometer and 460 nanometer and apart from that there is a small kink of uh, 370 nanometer so with these two we can say corresponding to this excitation the 370 nanometer excitation we have this emission peak at 460 nanometer and with the with the excitation of this uh, 320 nanometer we have the emission peak at 14 nanometers. So our focus is this 14 nanometer as it was earlier reported that 460 nanometer is pH insensitive. So to test the pH selectivity, pH sensitivity of our MOS2 quantum dots, we prepare a number of samples ranging from pH 1 to pH 13 and recorded their emission spectrum for an excitation wavelength of 20 nanometer. And interestingly, we observed that uh, for uh, pH 1, the fluorescence of MOS2 quantum dot is uh, fully quenched, while in case of pH 13, it is pronounced by uh, 200, uh, 200 times. So we can say this uh, pH 1 state is off state and pH 13 state is your uh, on state. Here I've also plotted uh, a, a linear curve showing uh, the PL intensity with respect to the pH and uh, here we can we can see that uh, at pH 2 the uh, the fluorescence of uh, MOS2 quantum dot is uh, fully quenched. So further uh, we also uh, we also uh, measured this uh, uh, this uh, emission spectrum for the three pH pH 1 pH 7 and pH 13 for the different excitation wavelength and we plotted this uh, 2D contour plot here uh, we observed that uh, there are a number of uh, uh, intense peaks like uh, in case of pH one, we have uh, uh, we have named it as uh, E one, which is the which has the highest intensity. While in case of uh, pH seven, it is named as E two and E three, and for pH thirteen, it is E four and E five. This E one uh, this E one corresponds to an excitation of uh, three seventy nanometer, and uh, while uh, in case of uh, B. Uh, it is E2 and E3, which corresponds to 370 and 320 nanometer. And uh, uh, for uh, for pH 13, it corresponds to uh, 320 and uh, 360 nanometer. So uh, the, the the thing is that uh, that what we observe here that uh, in case of pH 1, we observe only one emission peak that corresponds to the emission uh, excitation wavelength of 370 nanometer. That is 460 nanometer emission peak. While in case of uh, this uh, pH 7. 
we observe two emission peaks, one at uh, one corresponding to 320 excitation wavelength at uh, 410 uh, nanometer uh, emission uh, wavelength and uh, one at uh, one at 460 nanometer emission wavelength corresponding to this uh, 370 nanometer excitation. And similarly, PS13, we again observe this uh, this uh, uh, excitation uh, excitation uh, uh, excitation uh, emission peak at 3, uh, 441 nanometer corresponding to this uh, 320 and one at 460 corresponding to 370 nanometer. So we see uh, we, we can say that uh, while changing the pH, the position of uh, this uh, pH sensitive peak also changes. In case of pH 7, it is at uh, 410 nanometer. Uh, here it is at uh, 410 nanometer. And uh, when we, uh, we uh, reduce the pH, it is shifted somewhere at 370 nanometer, which is not visible here, but uh, it is there in the PL spectrum. And while for PS13, this uh, 410 nanometer emission peak shifted to 440 uh, nanometer emission. So we see that uh, in case of PH1, there is a blue shift in the emission uh, peak of, uh, of PH sensitive emission peak. And for PS13, there's a, uh, there's a red shift of uh, pH sensitive peak. So, so uh, we synthesize this MOS to quantum dots and these quantum dots uh, are uh, found to be pH sensitive. So why these are so? So the answer is that uh, adsorb functionalities. Uh, to test, to confirm that uh, what we are thinking is uh, right, we recorded this FTR spectrum for this, uh, these three pH uh, uh, quantum dots, pH1, pH7, and pH13, and we observed that all the FTR bands are at the same place except their intensities are changed. So in case of PS13, we have a higher intensity, while in case of PH1, we have a smaller intensity. So this suggests that uh, strong FTR peaks in PS13 are due to the presence of large number of functional groups. So uh, these are, uh, these bands are uh, uh, th these bands are uh, uh, these bands corresponds to the functionalities like uh, OH, NH2, and uh, sulfate. So uh, all these uh, functional groups have, are electron rich. So we can say the effectively uh, MOS2 surface is, has some negative potential. So uh, we, we found that, uh, we found two properties in our pH sensitive MOS2 that uh, it could be switched from off state to on state depending upon the pH from one to 30. And its fluorescence also changes its position from uh, 410 to 370 for pH1 and from 410 to 441 for pH 30. So we, we, we devised some mechanism to understand this. So pH sensitive optical switching of MS to quantum dots could be understood by protonation and deprotonation process. As I told that uh, the surface functionalities of MS to quantum dots are electron rich SPC. So when we make it, uh, a, make, make it a lower pH like the pH1, we are adding H plus ion. And because of this S plus ion, all the, all the negative functionalities uh, are uh, become neutralized. So the functionalities uh, over, over the functionalities over the surface of MOS2 get reduced, and hence the emission spectrum because of these functionalities are also get reduced. While in case of deprotonation, we are adding OH minus ion, which increases the electron density around the surface of MOS2 quantum dots, and uh, which uh, provides a higher uh, PL intensity due to these uh, surface functionalities. To understand this uh, uh, modulation of uh, modulation of uh, PL, PL sensitive MS to quantum modulation means the, uh, the shifting of uh, PL band depending upon the pH, we have a, uh, we have a device the mechanism depending upon the uh, quantum confined stark effect. So what is this quantum confined stark effect? So under the influence of an external field, the electron state that is conduction band shifts to lower energies while the whole state that is balanced band shift to higher energy. So if there's a strong electric field, the band gap of the uh, material will get reduced. So in case of pH 7, let's say the structure looks like this. And when we add, uh, add some H plus ion to make it pH 1, the surface functionalities uh, get reduced. And so the electric field, uh, because of this surface functionalities, uh, get also reduced, which leads to a band gap uh, increasing of uh, this uh, pH1. So we, we found a blue shift uh, in case of pH1. And as we add OH minus ion, so we are increasing the surface functionalities 
and uh, also the uh, electron density over the surface of this MOS2, which provides a stronger electric field and which leads to a reduction in the band gap of the material. And we, we, we observe a red shift in the uh, in case of PS13. So uh, these are the mechanisms to understand the pH sensitive MOS2. So let's come to the second, uh, second uh, uh, application of MOS2 quantum dots, which is uh, using it as a bioimaging probe for in vivo bioimaging of prosophila. Uh, of its uh, uh, elementary canal. So why we want to use MOS2 as a bioimaging probe? First of all, uh, till we have reported, uh, there was there was no report for the in view bioimaging of this uh, MOS2 quantum dome. So it was the first time that uh, we reported for uh, this uh, bioimaging, in view bioimaging. And the other problem with this uh, colloidal quantum dots is that with the passage of time, their fluorescence gets reduced. So we have to prepare a quantum dot which has a uh, long term for uh, PL stability. And the another thing is that earlier people have used uh, for this bioimaging that is a uh, cadmium based quantum dots, as I have already discussed, which is toxic. So uh, we have uh, we have uh, used this MOS2 quantum dots for uh, for uh, because of these reasons for imaging this uh, elementary canal of uh, drosophila. So uh, we, uh, we use this as the same hydrothermal method that we have already used uh, to prepare our MS2 quantum dots in case of, in case of uh, pH sensing. But uh, here we have changed our uh, synthesis parameter a bit that uh, earlier it was uh, the pH of the, uh, the pH of the reaction was the six points, solution was 6.5. While we change it to pH 5, we have increased the reaction temperature to 220 degrees Celsius and we also increased the reaction time which is 40 hours. Earlier it was 36 hours. So we obtain a uh, yellowish solution which contains MS2 quantum dose. We characterize our MS2 quantum dose by TEM. And we, we, we one can see here that uniform dispersion of uh, MS2 quantum dose with an average particle size of uh, 3.5 nanometer. Again, the phase of uh, MS2 quantum dose is confirmed by, by measuring this interlaced spacing, which is 0.27 nanometer corresponding to one OO plane. And uh, the, again, the phase confirmation is done through micro Raman measurements. Here again, we observe two characteristic E. One is uh, E2G and other one is uh, A1G with a separation of 24 centimeter inverse, suggesting that our quantum, dot, uh, quantum dots are multilayer in nature. So we, uh, we did this uh, photophysical properties for our synthesized uh, quantum dots. Here in the absorption spectrum, you can see uh, that uh, there are three absorption bands. One is 215 nanometer, another one is 265, and the last one is 375 nanometer. We also recorded this uh, emission spectrum of these uh, quantum dots corresponding to different excitation wavelengths ranging from 265 nanometer to 425 nanometer. The most pronounced emission we obtained for 265 nanometer, which is uh, obvious because of its uh, absorption at 265 nanometer. We also tested uh, the maximum PL intensities corresponding to different excitation wavelength, and we we obtained a parabolic nature. We suggested that uh, that uh, quantum dots that we have uh, synthesized uh, are polydispersed, uh, have polydispersity uh, nature. I mean, this uh, they have the different particle sizes. So uh, to uh, to investigate the uh, the environment of these MOS2 quantum dots, we did uh, FTR spectrum and uh, observed that uh, it had uh, several peaks corresponding to OH bending, CN stretching, uh, S double bond O and double bond CN OH stretching stretcher. So uh, we also tested uh, the long term PL stability. That was uh, our objective to test that whether our quantum dots sustain for a long time with a constant PL emission intensity or uh, its a PL intensity goes down. So we tested our quantum dots up to once 80 days, that is up to six months, and we observed that there is only 3% reduction in the uh, emission intensity of our quantum dots. And uh, the quantum yield calculated for our quantum dots is found to be around 2.3, which is uh, quite good for uh, an inorganic quantum dots. So uh, why are MS2 quantum dots are so stable? Why it has some so long-term PL stability? And uh, the, again, the, the, the answer is surface functionalized uh, MOS2, uh, surface functionalization of uh, this MOS2 uh, quantum dot. So here I have uh, shown two schematic to understand the whole process. If your quantum dot surface is not functionalized, then with the passage of the time, all the quantum dots, which are multilayer in nature and uh, we can say in disk shape, they will get gathered, they will get uh, stacked 
one over another so there will be no confinement and we don't uh, we don't have any peers but if there is a functionalization over the surface there will be electrostatic repulsion in between the particles so that all the particles will be dispersed in the uh, in the medium for a long time and we we have uh, an intense pl for a long time this was further confirmed by using this zeta potential measurement where we found that the surface potential, surface zeta potential of MOS2 quantum dot is minus 26.3 millivolt. If the zeta potential measurement is uh, less than minus 20 millivolt or greater than plus 20 millivolt, then the then the colloidal suspension will be stable. So here it is uh, less than minus 20 millivolt. Uh, so our uh, MOS2 quantum dot shows the stability, long-term stability, PL stability. So uh, as I told that uh, the surface functionality is electron rich, so there will be a negative potential. That also comes here, minus sign. So finally, we use our MOS2 quantum dots for bioimaging in Drosophila fly. Why we have chosen this Drosophila as a, as a model to investigate this bioimaging of our MOS2 quantum dots. So there are a number of uh, uh, advantages. Like if we try to develop a, a drug or any, any, any kind of thing, then our aim is to use that drug or any that material or the, that property in our daily life for humans. So we, we always choose a model which is uh, similar to human. So Drosophila fly is a, a model for organism of uh, eukaryotics, which are humans, and uh, it has a small life cycle. I mean, you can perform your uh, your experiments very fast. It has easy breeding. You, you didn't you, you need not to be worried about uh, very much for this uh, breeding or uh, any kind of thing. Because breeding is important to fed uh, while, while feeding this uh, while feeding this MOS2 quantum dot to the larva of this Drosophila. So in our study, we have uh, chosen two concentrations of uh, MOS2 quantum dots. One is 40 micro microliter per ml, and another is 80 microliter per ml. And we we feed this uh, these quantum dots to the to the Drosophila larva. This is uh, this is the condition third in star larva. And uh, these larvae uh, used to take these uh, quantum dots through their food. Uh, and uh, when they will uh, grow up, they will have these quantum dots in their stomach. So finally, we just uh, cut, bisect uh, the elementary canal of uh, Drosophila fly. Here, uh, here is the picture that, uh, that has been taken from a process microscope. In the first panel, that is figure A, B, and C, that shows the control panel. That is, uh, these are the elementary canals of those uh, flies, which uh, have uh, which have not uh, taken any uh, MOS2 quantum dots. And uh, figure uh, panel second and panel third are showing just uh, two, uh, showing the two elementary canals uh, having uh, having feeding feeding of 40 microliter per ml and 80 microliter per ml. So from here, you can see that uh, the the flies uh, the flies which uh, which has taken these MOS2 quantum dots in their food. Their elementary canal are fluorescing under pre inhibitor. So these MS2 quantum dots can be used as a bioimaging probe. So finally, these MS2 quantum dots uh, has been used also for metal and sensing. Here in this part, I am not going to discuss the series of MS2 quantum dots as the same quantum dot that we have used for bioimaging probe. So. Uh, why we are so concerned about this uh, Fe3 plus ion sensing? Because the uh, iron is a key factor of our hemoglobin or uh, human metabolism, and because of uh, because of the because of the imbalance of this iron, there are several problems. If iron level is uh, reduced in our uh, human body, then there's a problem like uh, limited oxygen delivery, fatigue, poor work performance, decreased immunity, and if it is in excess it can produce reactive oxygen species which can damage your lipids, the nucleic acids, and your proteins. And it is also of environmental importance for the growth and uh, breeding of uh, plants and trees. So our synthesized MS2 quantum dots has been uh, tested for uh, metal ion sensing, for Fe3 plus ion sensing. Here in the figure A, I've shown the interaction study. Interaction study means uh, we, we have taken our MS2 quantum dot and one by one we added uh, different metal ions. So, uh, and we recorded their PL spectra under a, uh, under a uh, constant excitation wavelength. From here, we can see that uh, the fluorescence uh, intensity of uh, our MS2 quantum dot gets reduced more than 50% uh, in case of Fe3 plus ions. 
So we, we can say that uh, these uh, Fe3 plus ion uh, are, are responding to our MS2 quantum drops. Our MS2 quantum drops are sensitive to these uh, Fe3 plus ions. Further, we, we also did uh, some interference study. Interference study is important because, uh, uh, let's say, uh, your uh, fluorescence of uh, MS2 quantum drops get quenched in presence of Fe3 plus ion. But you add some other ion, like uh, let's say copper or silver or any other. And uh, if MOS2 quantum dots regain its fluorescence, then we we, ca we cannot say that uh, this is a good probe. So it should not uh, it should not get uh, regain its uh, fluorescence. So for uh, testing, we did interference study, and uh, what we did that uh, in the solution of MOS2 quantum dot, we added this Fe3 plus ion, and uh, when its fluorescence get quenched, we tried to add another metal ions like copper, Fe2+, plus, nickel, cobalt, etc. And we observed that there is no change in the fluorescence uh, level of uh, this MS2 quantum dot. So we can say our MS2 quantum dots is sensitive only to this Fe3 plus ion. Further, to, uh, to measure the... Uh, to measure the, the Kindly conclude, uh, Dr. Misra. Yes, sir. I I'm just about to finish. There's one or two yeah. slides remains. Okay. So uh, we did this titration study ranging from this uh, 0 micromolar to 1 millimolar of 1 millimolar of this Fe3 plus ion, and uh, we see that there's a continuous reduction, uh, reduction in the fluorescence of uh, this MS2 quantum dots with the increasing level of Fe3 plus. So we also plotted this uh, Sternwarner plot, which shows a bending towards the x-axis, which suggests that there are multiple fluorescing sites, and we did time-dependent uh, fluorescence study. To understand whether this uh, quenching, the fluorescence quenching is uh, time dependent, that is dynamic, or time independent or static. And we observed that uh, the, the, the decay rate of these uh, MS2 quantum dot fluorescence is time independent. So we say that this quenching is purely static. And uh, interestingly, this uh, decay rate is uh, uh, suitable or fitted to a tri exponential function showing a multiple, uh, multiple sites, fluorescing sites. And we revisited our uh, fluorescence spectra and obtained that uh, there are uh, the three peaks, P1, P2, P3, at 450, 475, and 543 nanometer. So these fluorescence are not coming from a single fluorescence site. These are the combination of these three. And uh, with the addition of Fe3 plus ion, these three fluorescence peaks will and, uh, get, uh, you know, its intensity will get reduced, which is shown here. So. Uh, here I've shown the mechanism why this uh, MS2 quantum dots are sensitive to this Fe3 plus and how it is sensing this. So this panel shows the experimental uh, schematic and the second shows this uh, fluorescence mechanism. When MS2 quantum dots is yet excited, it goes to its uh, higher state and uh, gives PL emission. But presence of uh, Fe3 plus ion, this Fe3 plus ion get bounded, make a complex formation in its ground state and when we excite this complex, it goes to its excited state. But when uh, while relaxing, uh, while uh, during its relaxation, it follows a non-radiative process. So its fluorescence get quenched. So uh, summary of uh, my presentation, I can summarize like uh, we have synthesized this MOS to quantum dots using a bottom-up and fissile hydrothermal method. Our synthesized quantum dots are pH sensitive, so it could be used as a pH sensor. And this pH sensitivity comes from the surface constellation, and uh, it could be used for in view bioimaging, and uh, it is also uh, it could be also used for uh, metal ion sensing. So, uh, conclusion is that by changing the surface environment, we can make our MS2 quantum dots sensitive to a particular biomolecule or particular uh, micromolecule. So, uh, these quantum dots can be used uh, as a sensor. Uh, so uh, these are the acknowledgement. I'm uh, highly thankful to my PhD supervisor that uh, that I uh, presented here. All all these are my PhD works, and uh, I express my gratitude to my lab mates during my PhD. They helped me a lot, and I also thankful to my collaborator. Like uh, in bioimaging, I'm thankful to Professor Sri Krishna, Department of Biochemistry, Banaras University. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Monsu Mitra, for nice talk. Now it is time to conclude the session. I invite Dr. Sesa Sai Raman to conclude this session. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Verma. Thank you for Dr. Verma. Can you take off your video? 
Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much um, for spending almost three hours on the very illuminating talk, starting from the bioimaging and all kind of uh, nano quantum dots uh, for different applications. In fact, it's uh, it's a very very intriguing uh, discussion today, and very compact and very packed information. A lot of information shared by our panelists. First of all, I would like to thank all of our panelists who agreed and also willing to share all the information that would be helpful for all students, faculty, and researchers. Um, I wish to thank the attendees or participants that they stayed all over uh, for two days. We have to go for one more day. Tomorrow is the final day for our presentation. I don't know why my video is not showing. Okay. Um, today, uh, tomorrow we will be having the day three presentation and the closing ceremony. Uh, day three, we will start with uh, the introductions, welcome address by Professor Verma. And uh, we have uh, eminent speakers, Dr. Shobna Chaudhary from CSIR, Nishkan, New Delhi. She will be talking about, senior, she is a senior scientist. She will be talking about advances in polymer nanocomposites and electrolytes. Our second speaker, uh, Dr. Varsha Kare, uh, she will be, she is from Seoul National University, South Korea. She will be talking about challenges in materials, development for 3D and 4D printing possibilities for AIs. And then we have Dr. Navidra Dar. Uh, Dr. Dar will, uh, he is from Center of Material Sciences, Allahabad University, Prayagraj, India. Uh, he will be talking about characterizing techniques of liquid crystals. Then we have Dr. Uh, Rajesh Shukla, sir. Um, yes. Dr. Shukla will talk about, he is from University of Lucknow. He will be talking about synthesis of conducting polyaniline, metal doping and applications. So please stay tuned for listening. Uh, again, our final speakers will be here tomorrow. We'll be discussing their uh, research. Uh, with that, we will conclude with the uh, closing uh, note remarks. And also we'll try to share all the question and answer will be answered by all the questions from the attendees will be answered by our panelists. We will send to all the panelists so that you will get through by email and WhatsApp message. We will also share all the uh, day one activity we shared uh, with the link. You can download the link from WebEx or you can play back the links for those uh, two hour or three hour sessions for day two and day three will come up. Uh, with that, I would say that it's a great pleasure to see you all and then hope we will meet uh, at the same time tomorrow. Thank you, Professor Arma. Thank you, Dr. Sesa Sai. Uh, Professor Amar. It is Raman's day because uh, <laughs> two or three panelists discusses about Raman uh, <laughs> microscopy. <laughs> Yeah, I forgot to tell. I don't know somehow I'm related to Raman because my middle name is Sai Raman. So also, like I can tell you the story that uh, how I am related to Raman. Uh, I work with uh, this was explored over time. I'm the student of I was a PhD student of Professor Wen Shuaswa, and Professor Wen Shuaswa was a student of Professor Yair Verma. And year one more student was uh, Dr. Kishan, K.S. Krishan, I guess. Uh, so somehow the distant relative probably uh, my name is coinciding with the Raman. So just uh, <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, Do sir. You want to say something. No, sir. Thank you. I want to tell you thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. And thank we'll thank meet you. Tomorrow. Thank you, Imad, Thank you, sir. for Thank listening you, sir. Thank you, Prof. and staying for all the three hours. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we enjoyed, Prof. Verma. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ajit Kausik. Thank you. And...
Actually, we will ask uh, MR to discuss. Tomorrow, we were supposed to have one more lecture, Dr. Nicoletta Hickman. She is not there, then I will request uh, MR if, uh, because she, he works on the same FETs um, and different materials. Probably, if there is a slot, probably I can ask MR to provide his 10 minutes or 20 minutes uh, discussion about this topic. Okay. That sounds good, yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay.